start with your origin story. Uh, if you could tell me a little bit about where you're from, how your interest in comics started, and what are some of your first memories of comics? My first memories of comics, uh, when I was about seven, we moved to Saudi Arabia from Los Angeles, where I was born, in Long Beach. Grew up in Lakewood Boulevard, you know, in, in Lakewood, California, and then we moved to Saudi Arabia. My father worked for Aramco, Rastanora, Saudi Arabia, this big giant oil refinery on the Persian Gulf. And, oh, there was, I don't know, 10,000 people in the town. There was probably thir kids from 30 different nations and speak eight different languages in this international school there. And 45 miles inland was Dahran Air Force Base, U.S. Air Force Base. The United States has been there since 1942. And most people don't realize that. And there was a PX there, and that's where, as a little kid, I was encountering comic books at the there to a slice of America, you know, my earliest memories, been, I've actually, you know, tried to trace that down, my earliest memory of a comic book, there's two of them, there's one, a 1955 Superman 100 is what I traced down, but for years all I remembered trying to track it down, and since that issue is like more expensive, it took me a while to get one, it was this uh, uh, toy Superman robot contest, a little, 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 little tiny robots where they had a little controller thing. I mean, years before its time, and it would fly around, and it would like have heat vision and, and super breath, and <laughs> and there was a contest where the Daily Planet was running, and it was the first story in this Superman 100. And this other earliest memory I have of a comic book is uh, a Little Lulu that took me years and years to track down. I was like, mine. When we, I didn't find that one until we opened up Comics and Comics which we'll get to those origins a little mm -hmm. bit later of. And as Lulu collections would come in, I was sitting there just paging through. I remember Lulu telling stories to Alvin. And I just remember it's like several of them, but I was encountering single stories in these earlier Lulus, and it wasn't until, which made sense, it was 1957 when we moved over to Saudi Arabia. This was a 1958 Lulu and Alvin storytelling hour or time annual compilation from all these earlier John Stanley and Irving Tripp um, Lulu stories of, uh, yeah, I remember one where there, there, was, there was like a moat around this castle and Lulu was like st stuck in there and there's this weird dragon breathing fire and I had to find this again, which is, as I was learning to track down my childhood, it enabled me to realize that everybody else was trying to track down their childhood, which enabled me to um, understand the motivations of why people were trying to seek old comic mm -hmm. books. Um, well, well, let me ask you a question. Just getting back to your own interest in comic books. Sure. Uh, do Do you think that you identified with them? You know, because you were in Saudi Arabia and it was a part of America, or were there other reasons that you identified with them? Or, well, all of us little kids over there, we were all thrust out of whatever environment we were. So for me and probably a lot of other people I've talked with over the years and stuff like that, it was definitely a fantasy escape on one level. Part of it was a piece of trying to keep in touch with, you know, um, um, of America, yeah. you know, is reading these American comics. that, we, And when we left Saudi Arabia in 1962, it all got left behind. Oh, okay. And then I'm, I'm trying to, re I was in the 60s, when we got over two Americans, so right around the time when, by this time I'm 10 years old, I'm, I don't know, second grade, third third grade maybe, about third grade, uh, around, my, around the time of my birthday, there's this something, well, Amazing Fantasy 15 came out the week of my birthday, and my brother and I, we were like, we were collecting pop bottles, and my father used to drop us off about a mile out of town with a wagon, and we'd come back through and collect all the pop bottles out of the ditches on the way back into town, two cents each and you get six of those bottles and wash them out take them to the grocery Safeway or Hinky Dinky grocery store and redeem them for two cents and then each six bottles we'd be able to buy a comic book um, then when they started getting a 25 cent allowance a week mm -hmm. and there was two more comic books I could get and when that AF15 came out with the first appearance of Spider-Man I actually liked the bell ringer story in the middle who's old guy who's like ringing this, he was a lighthouse and he would go there faithfully ringing the bell and I just liked that story better at the yeah. time so I got into Spider-Man with 
probably number three when Dr. Octopus comes out and then Sandman comes out and then Dr. Doom's coming in then the Lizard's coming in and then you know, Electro comes in and it's just like it took on a whole world of itself. You know, well, let me ask you, you've mentioned a Superman comic, Spider-Man comic, and a Little Lulu comic. Uh, yeah. Little Lulu's really different from those other superhero comics. Did you find that you were drawn mostly to superhero, or did you have wide-ranging? Uh, oh, no, no, or, no. Were there certain types of comics that you liked better than others? See, we got enough time. We get. I, no, I was yeah. reading into all what, what you might call them genres and stuff like that. The Carl Barks, Donald Ducks, mm -hmm. absolute favorites right there. In the late 60s, before I had any superhero run completed, 1968, 69, I, when I had discovered Rocket's Blast Comic Collector in 1966, early part of that answering a GB Love ad in Marvel Comics, he placed the second, um, what do you want to call it, uh, classified ads okay. in the Marvel Comics, following the lead of this company out of Long, Long Beach publishing the Argosy comic book price guide. Didn't interest me, but when... This other ad said, send in a dollar and you get this this advertising magazine, RBCC, and an illustrated comic book collector's handbook. Um, anyway, what was the question again? Uh, I, I was just asking you, what, what types of comics were you most drawn to? Everything. Just everything. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's... Yeah, I can get balled down to some... Yeah, it's like just everything. Well, let me ask you a, a I like anything question. good. I was never... Collecting the character, I was never collecting a, com okay. a company. I don't understand people that, you know, just collected Marvels or just collected DCs yeah. or that warfare in between there or the ones that just wanted to read. Funny well, were animals. there certain titles that you were like trying to buy every issue as they came out? And you know, no. Early on, I was just trying to get one of every one ever just, printed. Just get what? You, okay. Just, just keep on going outwards yeah. and stuff like that. About 1960. Five or so before I got my first RBCC, there was a place in Fremont where we, my father had moved us back from Saudi Arabia back to where he had been gone from for 20 years from his childhood or when he left in the high school, joined the Navy in World War II and then was just gone 20 years and working in oil fields in Saudi Arabia. And I grew up in Africa and India and places. And um, my parents tell me I always had my head in a comic book. I said, how did you possibly see all the stuff we were looking at? You always had your head in a comic book. And I go, well, I had... Looking up from the pages, you know. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, um, well, how did how did uh, other students and friends of yours uh, view your comic reading? Do you have other friends that were into comics as well? Or there was a couple of us yeah. in Fremont. Um, I don't remember that well about that back in Saudi Arabia, but in America, because of the um, the comics code and stuff like that coming along, the the, the attacks on the comics, as, you know, you were actually looked upon as a I don't know, socially deviant, mentally retarded type of person if you read comic books, words and pictures together. But years later now, I viewed that, well, what the comics code thing was actually, I think, based off of decades of research, it was a, pretty much an attack by the Catholic Church on Jewish-owned businesses and bringing in these district attorneys, we're, we're saving the kids, and uh, for political purposes and stuff like that. But uh, no, back in, in the 60s, you didn't tell anybody mm -hmm. that you're a, a comic book collector. I mean, just I mean, you. Well, uh, well, how did your family feel about it? Because I know you mentioned your parents said you were, you know, had your head in a comic book. Were they supportive of it, or? Well, yes and no. In December 1965, I got a copy of Jules Pfeiffer's Great Comic Book Heroes, and first edition, you know, was in, under the Christmas tree. Uh, on the flip side of that thing, about 1966, we went down to Hemisphere uh, in San Antonio, Texas. And it was a, not a World's Fair, but it was a Hemisphere for North and South America, all in Houston, in San Antonio. My pop said, hey, we're going to drive down there. He gave my brother and me each 10 bucks. Okay. We're going to be gone two weeks. We drive all the way down there, and we get down to San Antonio. My father's filling up the gas tank. And I see this bookstore actually across the highway, and I walk over to it. And I go in there and ask, you got any old comic books? Um, let me backtrack up a little bit. There was, in Fremont, there was a World War II vet had his legs blown up. He's in a wheelchair. He ran this thing called Ace Magazine Exchange. What was It was actually a front for this. He had the floating poker game in the back that was running 24 hours, seven days a week. And people in town, would, the guys in town would just come into this poker game. But up front was... All these comics, magazines, and stuff, paperbacks, a nickel apiece. He'd pay two cents each, trade you two for one. And I remember thinking I died, had gone to heaven. Uh, 
somewhere in there where there were two comics from the 1940s. They were, wow, 1940s comics. One was a Carl Barks, uh, Lost in the Andes, Square Egg Story, uh, Donald Duck, Four Color, 223, um, Orange Cover. It's like they go, and it's, the other one was Marvel Mystery 92, the last yeah. issue of Marvel Mystery 92, and it's got the origin of Human Torch in the front, a Captain America story, and uh, Miss America story, I believe, in the thing, oh, plus a Witness story, one of three or four appearances of this character called The Witness. And it was like 10 cents, I come home, I died and gone to heaven, I got 1940s comics in my growing collection that my brother and I were growing together. But down in, jumping over to San Antonio here, I, in terms of my parents being supportive, had this 10 bucks. I go into this bookstore across the street while Pomp's getting gas and ask me, got any old comic books? He's, he pulls out some, yeah, we got some old comics here. And I see, oh my God, there's ECs in this box, which I'd only like been reading about. Um, I had just gotten my first RBCC, which I'd taken with me. I mean, I was, I mean, some of us back then, I mean, I'm 14 years old when I got my first RBCC. Uh, around the same time that Bud Plant and other friends of mine were responding to that same first ad of GB Loves, and they got their issues too. I mean, we, we started out, it was a whole crop of us started out in fandom at the same time. Okay. We all tend to be born in 1952. I mean, Mark Gavineer's yeah. from 1952. Uh, I think uh, Scott Shaw's from 1952. There's a whole crop of us that's amazing that one year. Yeah. But I'm flipping through the thing, and I come across, oh, wow, here's Mad Number 1. How much is this? $5. And some of these ECs, these science fiction ECs, which I'd been reading about a little bit and not having any, and Weird Science 18 and 19. I still remember the covers. There's Wally Wood, atomic bomb explosion cover with these spaceships flying around it. And how much are they? A buck and a half a piece. So here I get... These three comics, it's eight bucks. I come walking back across the street. I'm just in seventh heaven. My father is, what, what do you got there? What are those, funny books? How much you pay for those? I, I, I told him, you paid $5 for a bleep bleep comic book? Are you effing nuts? And so, You're not getting any more money the rest of the weekend. I, said, I didn't care. I read that mad number one probably 30 times or so over the next, I mean, just oh, yeah. memorized that thing and had to get more. And it's just, this is part of the quest where, you know, parents want to be supportive. People didn't understand what was things going on. But a couple issues later, after, by the time RBCC 47 floats around, my brother and I sent in a dollar. It was 10 cents a, a, a line for classified ads in the RBCC. We placed our first ad. I mean, I had X-Men 1 through, 1 through 25, dead mint, you know, 10 bucks with a stack, didn't sell. Spider-Man 1 was 4 bucks. Hulk 1 was 4 bucks. FF1 was six bucks, and it started selling stuff. So that one dollar ad brought in, I don't know, twenty five dollars. Okay. So then the parents started loosening up, and, and then, then encouraged by that, I started knocking on the door in every, I mean, every house in Fremont. I was like doing a methodical grid thing of like knocking on the doors because at some point, newspaper article appeared that appeared all over the country about this place in Hollywood called Collector's Bookstore. Lynn Brown and Malcolm Willits, and they just, I mean, the storyline in the article was, I mean, there's this trunk, and, he, and in the picture, Leonard Brown is, he's holding Superman 1 and Batman 1, and they paid $100 for this trunk in this unclaimed storage auction. They just said, well, it was like, they didn't know which un storage unit it was, so they started buying every storage unit till they hit pay dirt, half a dozen <laughs> into them. So the story went, it, that was in the newspaper. Yeah. I mean, I got to know Leonard Brown and Malcolm Willits years later, I one of a couple of people that were in their, their um, time vault that they had, a bank, former Bank of America right on Hollywood Boulevard. But I mean, that, that was the store that, when we opened up comic, that first comics and comics store in, on, in Berkeley, which we'll get to, that was the store we were emulating and trying to uh, copy um, in terms of, uh, but. Well, to step back a little bit from sure. when you opened the store, now you, you placed this ad, and now how did that kind of evolve into the uh, conventioneering? Because you started going to cons pretty, pretty Well, this was October too. 1966. Yeah. We placed that first ad. Okay. This no, RBCC number 47. Buddy Saunders, who runs Lone Star Comics chain store down in um, Dallas, Texas area, and runs mycomicshop.com on uh, the Internet these days. It's big, you know, giant dealer like Chuck Rosansky is at Mile High. Um, which I used to be, but I had a warehouse flood. A million comic books got destroyed, which is a whole other story in itself. Uh, 
Um, we place I placed another ad and a couple other issues later and stuff like that, and we started doing these regular ads in RBCC on a, on a regular basis. But in May of 1967, my brother died of leukemia, and that was quite a shock and stuff like that. He just up got sick, died three weeks later. The wow. version of leukemia didn't even have a name yet. I'm firmly convinced that um, we used to travel back and forth between L.A. and visit. Uh, my, my father had a Navy buddy in St. George, Utah, who had a motel, maybe half a dozen bungalows and a hamburger stand there. And, and you know, in the early, mid-50s and stuff like this, before going over to Arabia, and they used to do all these uh, open-air atomic bomb tests on all these clouds. I remember years later seeing a uh, newspaper article, headline in Salt Lake City newspaper, of, you know, 45,000 head of sheep just killed by a nuclear cloud that went through from that testing they were doing in Nevada. Well, they blew off like hundreds of bombs there. The, the radiation was going somewhere. And the preponderance of cancer in America from kids born 1948 to 58 is the greatest of all the groups for weird leukemias and stuff like this. So that was mid-May of 1967 and stuff like that. And that first ad we placed was Mark Scully and Roy Venario. They'd opened up Roy's memory shop, the comic book store down in Houston, and they had started starting some of the first comic book conventions. Uh, they say the first one was Bernie Bubnis putting on one in 64 in New York, and then... Jerry Bales and Ed April and Jack Promo and some other guys cranked up the first real convention, the Detroit Triple Fanfare. Shel Dorff was part of that group. Um, that's 1964 also, but it's technically, it's later than this little one-day thing at a YMCA. This was a full-fledged convention. Triple Fanfare being comics, science fiction, and I forget the other thing. Moot film, there we go. Mm -hmm. And... They'd had a three-and-a-half-page ad full of all kinds of comics, but there was a little cryptic, Houston Con is coming, June of 67. So my brother died. I, I need to get out of Fremont. I mean, I grew up as a white minority person in dark-skinned countries. We moved to Fremont. I was telling my mom, so, there's too many white people in this town. I don't know how to relate, which is, I mean, there's whole bunches of levels in play. of. So I get on a Greyhound bus in Fremont, Nebraska. I just buy a ticket. I set I didn't ask them. I just tell them I'm leaving to go to this thing called a comic book convention in Houston, Texas. It's 28 hours down from Fremont, Nebraska, down to Houston, Texas. I'm 14. I arrive at the thing. It was held June 17th and 18th. I turned 15 that first day of the show. I mean, I'm that was my birthday. It's like, and uh, on the way down, um, it changed buses. I think in Kansas City and Oklahoma City. When we got to Oklahoma City, and I'd already been on the the road for quite some time and it was a straight shot there no more bus changes all the way to Houston the bus pulls in we're all told to get on to the next bus and I had at the local Campbell soup factory I'd gotten these chicken boxes these frozen chickens uh waxed big things four one foot stacks with a big you know heavy cardboard you know, thing down there and I roped them all up and stuff like this and he said your luggage will catch up with you and stuff like this and little Bruce Banner here turned into the Hulk and I started screaming no I gotta have my comics you know and I just no this bus can't leave and stuff like this no 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 I'm just being a 14 year old crazy person that my comic books might disappear right. and I'm going down to a comic book convention I won't have anything when I get there and I have no way once I get to the bus station I gotta figure out how to get over to wherever this Ramada Inn was um I mean, I was so dumb then, I didn't even know. What do you mean I need $5 to buy a table? And I, that, it got to the evening. Oh, my God, where am I going to sleep at tonight? I mean, all these things were like, yeah. you, know, you know, baptism in fire. But, yeah, the other people on, on the on the bus, you know, they, they, all, they, they all jumped in. And literally eight people, eight guys got off the bus and pulled all my boxes onto this other bus to go down to Houston, and they, everybody else grabbed their own luggage and stuff like that. The bus driver was pissed at me you know, the whole <laughs> way down because of that because they're running behind schedule. And so anyways, get down there, um, and long story short, there in, in a way, I mean, I bought my first piece of original artwork there. So it was $6 for a little Abner Sunday page from the mid-1950s by Frank Frazetta. Uh, and I'd already been getting the Conan and Tarzan Ace paperbacks with the Frazetta painting covers by that point. I had just been coming out. And let me, this is drawn by Frank Frazetta. And uh, 
And I got a cool Frank Rosetta story at New York City we need to get into. And uh, I got my, uh, the other highlight that I got was an A.C. McClurg first printing of Tarzan of the Apes. It was an auction, and I won the auction. It was $12, like, with the dust jacket. No, no, no dust jacket, no dust jacket. Those, yeah. But uh, um, all I know is I came back with about $100, and all those comics, those eight boxes were jammed full and roped up, and I had a little grocery bag, you know, paper grocery sack, and it was about like a foot of comics inside there too. So I came yeah. back with more than I left with and some money. And then the next year... That was 67. Then in 68, there was a Dallas convention that I got down to. And then in 69, by this point, I got, uh, you know, 11th grade, I got my driver's license. And, and were you selling at all these uh, events also? Is oh, every show I went everyone? to. Okay. Every show I went to up so until. So you were there just as a fan, even at that first one. You were already. Well, there, no, yeah. no, we were all fans. Yeah. No, it was all, it was Wait. just, it was, it was buying, selling, and trading. Yeah. A lot of trading going on. Okay, gotcha. Um, a lot of people looking at their stuff, but. You call them dealer collectors. Okay, right. Okay. The concept of making a living at it was still down the road. Of, you know, I didn't know you could make a living supporting yourself okay. selling comics because all the money I was making was I, 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 I adopted the philosophy. Some people just buy and never sell. I adopted the philosophy of once I read it, um, I mean early on, once I read it and I've had it, I mean I'm buying and selling stuff. But this, this takes like Spider-Man number one. Yeah. In my life, I bought and sold like a thousand copies of yeah. Spider-Man number one. AF-15, uh, at least 500 copies over the years. So you didn't need to have it and stuff like this, but you buy and sell it, you get more of this stuff. For me, the net result was the, the collections are increasing in the number of comics. Wow. I was on a quest to get one of every one ever printed. So in 68, I got down to this Dallas convention. Um, and... Yeah, that's, by, uh, by this point, I'm 16 years old. In Nebraska, you got your driver's license at 16. And my uh, first car was a Rambler Classic, which we took down, me and a couple friends. All right, Steve Johnson and uh, who else? Um, Daryl. Anyway, Daryl Skelton becomes a comic book artist, actually, uh, doing the Dallas comic strip and it's like for, for years. I then Star Trek stuff for DC and all kinds of other stuff. Anyways... There met Bud Plant and this whole San Jose crowd contingent. Um, um, there was Ed April from, he was a teacher up from uh, uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, Russ Cochran was coming into the thing. Um, Irving Bigman had a son, Larry Bigman. But Irving had been in the, he was retired. He was, he was Larry was like 12, 13 years old, and his parents were kind of in their 50s or 60s. So, um, But Irving was retired, he, you know, had had a furniture store. And he took a lot of us under our wing and taught us how to buy and sell stuff. I mean, yeah. on, on so very, various business principles that were fascinating to learn from. Um, but uh, in 69, and there's more and more ads being placed, and something called Stan's Weekly Express started up. Um, there's a guy named Don McGinnis in Dayton, Ohio. He'd been running auctions in RBCC where he, he just got every issue. There was, he was just thousands of um, he had his own mimeograph things that he s supplied ready sheets to gb love and rbcc back even when it was um mimeographed because it doesn't turn photo offset wrap around to like number 52 and i started with number 44 but those that marvel ad like the circulation like tripled and gb loves like getting later and later getting the issues out and we find out you're 19, how was it, 71? He never mentioned a word. He just kept apologizing for the late issues. It's cerebral palsy. And so there's this cerebral palsy guy trying to collate these issues that were like, you know, half an inch thick. I mean, hundreds of, a couple hundred pages on some of these things. Yeah. And he's doing it by himself, you know. And he, all of a sudden he's got like a circulation of like 2,000. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, number 49 or 50 was the last. Anyways. So, Dallas convention, and by this, and then by that point, I got a car and stuff like this, and we went to uh, '69. Went back down to Houston in the summer, and the concept of going to New York was still next year. And then, uh, Steve Johnson and I, we drove down to the St. Louis World Science Fiction Convention. I mean, there um, we set up a comic book table at World Science. We we're one of the first people doing that, and. 
science fiction purists were, you know, pretty snooty to us. Um, I think one person actually spit mm. at our, in our direction going, get out of our convention. We don't want comic book people here. Um, even though we're really into science fiction also, you know, like reading it. Yeah, so, so back in those days there was still oh, oh, the animosity was the pretty, pretty overt. The, yeah, yeah. No different than the early 70s when the comic book conventions started taking off and comic book fans were being snooty to Star Trek fans. Yes. I mean, it's just... I, I, all this nonsense never ceased, has never ceased to amaze me <laughs> how, you know, to me, the evolutionary process of what I call um, popular culture is, you know, keeps up with technology, and so the technology of comic books going into... Well, did you have an interest in science fiction? Some always, of the other, the other, always, you know, genres? always. I mean, yeah. I'm read it all you just name the author yeah. uh, asimov to whoever sturgeon to whoever you know larry niva i mean um frank herbert to, you know just all of it the burroughs books i mean it was like it was on a quest yeah. i got that first tarzan of the apes for 12 bucks the ac mcclurk first printing of it i mean i went gaga i, I got to get all the tarzan first printings and all that in the john carter's and the david inns uh you know Carson of Venus and the Pellucidar ones and just and then I'm discovering oh my god there's these things called pulp magazines you know I got my first weird tales and I discover all these Conan stories well they're in weird tales but then there's also these gnome press editions from the early 50s that are hardcovers so you start getting off into all the different incarnations as each generation was reintroducing I look upon it as like every generation like the wheel gets reinvented yeah. They, they think yeah. it's all new, and it's like, no, no, this stuff's been going on for a long time, yeah. you know. I mean, it's like they want to, it's like tomorrow we're doing a thing about superheroes past and present on one panel, but, you know, you look at where did Superman come from? Where did Spider-Man come from? I go, from my perspective, and talking with just hundreds and hundreds of these guys that created this stuff, it's just the world around you. You mm -hmm. absorb everything. And they want people want to speculate. Well, do you think Jack Kirby or somebody like, or Jerry Siegel, do you think they read this specific science fiction magazine to, to get this idea? Well, of course they did. They yeah. saw everything coming out on a newsstand like any of us today would see things coming out. Um, now we do it on, on Amazon.com. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's just easier. But there's so much of it coming out. But by 19... That 1969, that St. Louis Worldcon, we went down there. Um, Von Bode had just gotten out of the Army. He had, still had real short hair. Um, green Army jacket was still on, his blue jeans. Uh, Larry Todd, Jeff Jones. And they had a special art showing there. So there was a guy walking around the dealer's room and stuff like that. It's like at concerts, somebody might be walking around saying, you know, weed, speed, acid, and stuff like this. There was a guy walking around. He was going, Kirby, Ditko. Adams and stuff like this, kind of like muffled and stuff like that. And we picked up on the concept because we were comic book. I mean, you know, and went upstairs to this hotel room, and there was, um, it was filled full of original artwork from Marvel and DC. And um, not, not, I mean, back then, they were giving artwork away in the letters pages of like Adam Strange, Julie Schwartz, where you get a letter published, you get the whole chapter of, you know, Infantino, Adam Strange. Um, the scuttlebutts would be around, and they were throwing this stuff away. Nobody cared about it and stuff like that. I mean, like that little Abner, Abner by Frazetta. I mean, I always got, got into the art, but it was, it was $6, you know. I mean, opening bid, I think, was $5, and it you know, took a minute or two in increments of 10 cents or something to get up to okay. 6 bucks, and everybody else dropped out, and I ended up with this Frazetta little Abner, to me, which was mind-blowing to my little brain, oh, yeah. but nobody was really into the artwork back then, or very few people were. Cochran was. Russ Cochran was. Ed April was. Um, these are names that should be explored, and as you develop whatever it is you're going to develop for telling the history of the this comics world, the ver two very famous names, Cochran should be interviewed. He's still alive. Ed April got killed in a car accident in snow um, back in '72. I dated his older daughter for a while. Okay. Yeah, but uh, um, in '69 there, and then. As I got the vehicle and stuff in 69, and my ranging out into antique shops went outside of Fremont. Uh, I was getting into Omaha. I was getting down to Lincoln. I was, uh, I was driving over to Des Moines. Uh, there was all kinds of stuff just all over the place. A lot of times when I was earlier on, when I was knocking on the doors in Fremont, Nebraska, and I, hey, you got any old comic books, pulp magazines, big little books you want to sell? Blah, blah. Some people just gave me this stuff. Oh, this just saved me from throwing it away. Thank you very much, you know clean this old moldy stuff out. 
And uh, as this grew, I went into one place and stuff, a bookstore just opened up, and it turned out to be the former headquarters of Pop Wheat Giveaways, um, a Pop Wheat company that was making cereal and stuff like this. And I went in there, and this guy had just taken over this bookstore, was on the ground floor, and asked me, if he had, yeah, you got any old comics and stuff like this? He said, there was a whole pile of stuff down in the basement. It's comic stuff, but I'm not quite sure. And I'm, I got a white T-shirt on and actually, you know, white, light blue jeans. I go down there and hadn't been touched in decades. This company had gone out of business around 1950. So anyways, I'm down in there, so it had been not touched down there. I'm down in there, and I come back out, and, you know, I'm just I'm covered in dirt, you know, just oh, like an inch of, I mean, I had a, but through the, these mounds, there's all these Captain Marvel giveaways of Captain Marvel's Magic Eyes, Lightning Box, Flying Captain Marvel's, um, and Pop Wheat giveaways of Dick Tracy, Little Orphan. Anyways, long story short, because of that, it's like I talked the guy into taking me, it was take all this stuff over to the de- this thing called the Detroit Triple Pan Fair that was getting ready to happen in, in a week. So I got over there, and I'm swapping all this stuff and for old comics. Um, Bernie Rison was a guest at that show. Uh, I brought old comics, and this guy Tom, I can't remember his last name, uh, Antiquarian Bookstore was the place. But uh, Tom, what was his last name? Too many people. But he dropped me off there for the weekend. He went on to visit his sister that lived in Detroit, um, and I'm there, and Bernie Wrightson was a guest, and he's trying to walk around with his original artwork, swapping, trying to swap it for old comics, and I was one of two people that did that that weekend. So um, we became good friends all through these years and stuff like this. This is where you know the fascination for the actual artwork um, was beginning in my life as well as collecting the comics. So a lot of the comics were getting sold to start adding to this art collection. I met 1970, Steve Johnson and I, went, we did a whole bunch of shows. We drove out to the only, in Easter weekend, we drove out to the only um, convention ever held at the Disneyland Hotel. Okay, and that so was in 1970? Easter of 70. Okay. One time it was a comic book convention there and they, it overwhelmed the sensibilities of Disney management that weekend is all I can say. Okay. But in late 69, after we'd gone to that Detroit Triple Fanfare, there was a couple earlier fans named uh, um, Bill Regeer, is the one we dealt with, and another fellow named Chuck Moss, who had gotten into comics fandom early, and they started speculating on comics early on. Um, oh, by Spider-Man number seven, they bought 50 copies of it. By number, the Green Goblin issue, they were, they were up to like 200 copies. Were, this is 1964-65. Some people, this is the ear, some of the earliest stuff. Long story short there, there was 10,000 comics. He wanted 10 cents a piece to dump them out, what was left of what he had. He'd already sold years before the Spider-Man 1 through 6s that they had. Mm-hmm. But there was 200 copies of Avengers number 1, 200 copies of X-Men number 1, 300 Daredevil 1s, 300 Hawkman 1s, lots of other stuff. Um, I mean, I... They they dropped out of fandom in 19, March of 1965 um, as comic book conventions were trying to get up off the ground. There's there's photos in the back cover of like Alter Ego of something called uh, Jerry Bales' Alley Tally Party, where they're okay. adding up the tally awards and stuff like that. Chuck Moss was there. The photographs were taken by this fellow Chuck Moss, Bellevue, Nebraska. And a long story short there, there was this attempt to get a national convention going and... Bernie Bubness had done this little thing in New York. There was uh, this thing announced for Detroit in September. So here, and, but they were exchanging letters with Jerry and with you know, Chuck was and stuff like this. And they would, said they wanted to, how about we do a national convention in Omaha, which would attract people from the East and West Coast. These are ads that are in the RBCC. So okay. they, they can be looked up. They can be added into a record of sorts to describe visually what I'm de- describing verbally. And they wanted to... Um, put on the National Convention, one of the letters there was a misunderstanding of some sort because this Detroit Triple Fanfare that Shell and Jerry was stuff were doing in September of uh, 65 here. Um, Jerry had written back, well, it sounds like a good idea, you know, I might come to it, but he didn't commit to coming. Uh-huh. So they took that as a yes. They ran an ad in RBCC saying, Jerry Bales is going to be at this National Convention in June, and then Jerry wrote back, so I'm not going. We're doing this one ourselves in D- Detroit in September. There was a lot of politics. So... They were so 
They felt humiliated. This is what Bill Regeer re related to me. And it's nobody's fault on any of the levels and stuff. They were young guys. You know, Jerry had said, it sounds like a good idea. You know, I, right. something I, I would like to come to. I'm but not saying I'm going to come to it. You right. know, so but they, they got, they, they, they felt weird. They dropped out of fandom. Okay. Um, they felt humiliated. But it wasn't nobody's fault. It was just something that happened. And um, they had, so you, you got to visualize 10,000 comics, but nothing was after March of 1965. This is after we've been to the Detroit Triple Fanfare, and he saw something about, I was leaving flyers all over the place at this point in, uh, you know, laundromats, you know, buy comics. You know, the little thing with the phone number, you like cut up about an mm -hmm. inch and tear off and stuff. And, Stuff like this. I was leaving this stuff and stuff and all over the, all over the western Nebraska as I'm learning more and more about how to get your message out, which is it's like you know if a tree fell in the forest, did it, if nobody heard it, did it make a sound type of thing? And I'm like yeah. learning this stuff. I'm still in high school. Things learning from learned from Irving Bigman that Larry Bigman's still alive. He's a doctor of psychiatry up in Northern California. You guys should interview him too. He was at all the early Comic Cons. He's got an interesting perspective because he's become a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I visualize myself as a comic book psychiatrist, all these collectors that would call up and they're working themselves through whatever it is they're working them. Yeah, and that's a whole other story. So we get these 10,000 comics. And holy sh I mean, there's like, you know, stacks and stacks of all this early stuff. And there's also a whole bunch of stuff from the 1940s. And then we drive out to this Disneyland convention. You know, by this time I got my 65 Chevy Impala, and we got a U-Haul trailer on the back. You know, it's like, bought the 65 Chevy Impala. I mean, it's the, the slope back roof one. I don't like the 64. The 65 is the cool one. I bought that in 60. Like, God, what it cost me? Two hundred dollars. <laughs> bought off of comic books though. I'm buying my own stuff now. Yeah. So here, here we had this, these 10,000 comics. This actually the first time we got a U-Haul trailer to go out. And we're so overweight, uh, I think we blew two tires on the way out, but we blew up the engine. And this is Thursday of uh, before Easter weekend. And we get the, I, I'd gotten AAA, so we got it towed in and stuff like this. And we well, talked. Where were you when the engine blew? Had you made it all the way out? Oh, uh, yeah, Western right? Nebraska. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. There weren't any freeways back then. Yeah. You got to realize this. There weren't any freeways yet to speak of. I mean, yeah. And then what freeways there were, they weren't interconnected yet. And um, we talked to this guy, we just begging him and stuff like that. But he, he got an engine. He put this engine. He worked all night long. We helped him. Charged us five hundred dollars for the engine and all this labor, which he, you know. And um, you know, so we got back on the road. We didn't get there until noon on Saturday, and we had all these stacks and stacks of stuff and it's like this i mean we got ripped off blind we had four tables i mean yeah. just the shoplifting was outrageous <laughs> so we're you know on, on some levels and stuff like this but um that show and then leading into this is april of 70 now we've, we've been inspired we started making a fanzine around this same time um that was april in may um of 70, we noticed that a few issues earlier, a few months earlier and stuff like that, Steve Ditko, who, who we liked a lot, uh, and been getting all these pre-hero Marvels and these Charltons and getting all, just all these obs really obscure Ditko stories, and kept wanting more and more and more of everything, right, as, as these collections kept growing and, you know, dealing to make the collections grow bigger and then buying collections realizing oh yeah well we don't need to keep a static copy it can all be for sale because the net result was as the months progressed as the years progressed you know we kept getting more and more copies of things and stuff like that um, but but I digress and stuff like that so in May of 69 we called up Steve Ditko on the telephone because he had stopped doing Hawk and Dove with number three and then, I think it was May of 69 is when Creeper number six came out, and it's got a Gil Kane cover. And we're starting to realize, oh, what's going to happen? Is like Gil Kane going to take over Creeper also, and Ditko's not going to do anything? So we, Brooklyn, director of information, you know, just called the operator. He's listening in the phone book and called him up. 
And the first thing out of her mouth was, uh, um, hi, we've been boycotting Spider-Man since you left. When are you coming back? Which disarmed him. He laughs. And he says a couple lines that put me on this quest that I've been attacked for a lot by a lot of people over the these last bunch of years of, I mean, they're not attacking the data, they're attacking me for they're shooting at the messenger, I guess. But he said something, We've, you know, we're just high school students, we've been, well, why didn't you record it? I don't, was, I don't know, it's like, how do you get a tape, you know, real, real tape recorder connected to a telephone, uh, whatever, you know, and uh, so there's just a couple lines there. Well, the publisher had promised royalties, you know, if, if the thing took off and he said the Saturday morning cartoons had started coming out, the trading card set, stuff like this, and he walked. He tried to get Vitko to, Kirby to walk with him at the same time, and, um, that was that, and then this 20-minute conversation went off into other directions about creativity and everything, and we were going to do this scoop in about it. Right? I actually you had about half of a Ditto Master typed up on our fanzine. We'd already had two issues out of this thing called Fanzation. And you know, a couple weeks later, we got a letter from Steve Ditko, playing, please don't you run this and stuff like this, and uh, he sent a letter in about creativity to, to Steve and stuff like this, and... Uh, yeah, later on, Frederick Wortham in his last book called The World of Fanzines, where he exonerates comic book fans in this book. He studied fanzines back. I mean, I remember we were running these ads for our fanzine in RBCC, and I'm coming home from high school because I graduated in May of 69 from, high, from 12th grade and getting ready for college in that September of 70 for school. And uh, I'm coming in the house and stuff like that from high school, and... My mom, the phone rings. My mom goes, Bob, there's a doctor, Frederick Wortham, on the phone for you? And I go, yeah, right. I, go, <laughs> yeah, I was trying to figure out which comic book collecting friend of mine was like, playing you know, a, playing a prank on Playing yeah. a prank <laughs> and stuff like this. And I get on the phone, there's this really thick German accent. Oh, I, I'd like to order a subscription to, to Fanzation. Um, are, are you going to be coming out with future issues? I have been ordering fanzines and... And they don't come out with an issue. I mean, are you going to be publishing more issues? And I go, oh, yeah. So he got copy number three. You know, we sent him one and two. And we talked on the phone for a little while. Um, Fanzation is referenced nine times that I've been able to figure out in his book, including he quotes almost entirely this letter by Steve Ditko on creativity on how comic book fans have been. He doesn't connect the dots that Steve Ditko is a professional who invented spider-man you know he's, just, he's not there in his book it comes out that comes out in 1974 so that's like five years from when i you know by this point i'm we're already out in comics and comics when the book arrives and i see you know fanzation in the same paragraph with alter ego is one of the references uh, there's this index in the back that's completely inadequate i mean there's mm -hmm. it's referenced in the index there like two or three times and two of those are on the wrong page type of things and and then the other references just aren't in the index. It just, but then he died that year, later that year. Was, okay. But he exonerates comic book fans of, hey, he made a mistake, and he's trying to apologize. And this is what he was doing with me on the telephone. We talked, and then we exchanged letters and stuff like this. All those letters were destroyed in this warehouse flood later on. Uh, my fan letters with Hal Foster, um, um, all kinds of, my, my entire existence in comics fandom was destroyed in February 1986 in this warehouse flood where I had all this, a million comics stored, half a million baseball cards, a bunch of concert posters, several thousand pages of original comic book art. You know, same weekend, Eclipse Comics got destroyed. And my warehouse, Best of Two Worlds warehouse was uh, 43 miles away. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Back into uh, May of 70 there, and we're getting our fanzine out. There's a major collector of fanzines, uh, Tom John and Tom McGeehan. They ran the House of Info. They rated our fanzine a five for content. So number five's got a article in there by Jerry Bales on the on the origins of Alter Ego. Uh, it's also got a Ted White article in there about the origins of EC fandom. And another one, Jack Promo, who was one of the founders of Detroit Triple Fanfare with Shel Dorf and Jerry Bales and Ed April. He's another original EC fan. His, his perspective of the origins of EC fandom, we're talking fanzine fandom of EC uh, back then. And then Bill Wallace, he does an origins of uh, Houston Comics fandom in there also. I mean, 
plus there's some other features. It's got a Reed Crandall Tarzan cover too, as I got from uh, Roger Hill. It was a preliminary, detailed pencil preliminary. We ran that on the cover of it, and then, but that, yeah, number five was May of uh, May of '70. That's right. Yeah, the number three with the Steve Ditko letter. That's a little bit earlier. So, anyways, um, by this point, the summertime of '70 came came started coming across when we got that last issue of, the, of Fanzation done. But I was a bellhop down at the Pathfinder Hotel, a five-story, 1880s built, solid brick. It blew up in 76. So it was a gas leak in the bottom, and like a, oh, wow. like a firecracker went off uh, in a can. And this five-story big block hotel went up in the air and this big hole in the ground. And oh, wow. That's a, a whole other story in itself. But, yeah, it's like we were using the um, photo duplicator down there at the hotel, and we... Something happened, and the hotel manager got all mad. I quit my job. I was bellhop down there, and the elevator operator, and room service, and et cetera. It's like, yeah. So in the summer of 70 is when I ended up going to a number of conventions, and we never got another issue of Fanzation out to follow up on what we'd been doing with 3, 4, and 5. And um, in June... Got a couple, few weeks later, we found ourselves down at the first multicon in Oklahoma City. Um, Buster Crabb was the guest of honor there. Oh, wow. um, he talked about Hollywood and how he got typecast on Flash Gordon, how he had to be a self creator in a TV series, which is why how Captain Gallant came about uh, in the mid 50s, and his son is the little kid in Captain Gallant and stuff, but he got typecast and he, he was, sounded pretty bitter, I thought. Okay. Even though he had fond memories, there was this bitterness of being typecast. It's like, I mean, m most of the people in Star Wars or whatever, you know, they, they get typecast, you know. Um, pick another TV show. I mean, the original Star Trek people, most of them, they get typecast. Uh, on and on and on it goes. You just get identified there. They can't progress in their craft. So we're, we're at this Multicon. A couple weeks later, we drive to New York City for our first New York City show, Suling Con as they were being called, July 4th weekend, four-day shows. Um, we got there, um, again, we got there, and Suling had oversold the dealer's room. So we got there, I mean, there was uh, Ray Walsh from Curious Bookstore in Lansing, Michigan. He got there. A bunch of other people wanted in buying tables, but they were sold out in the main room. So Phil solves this thing where he goes out real fast and he rents a big pile of card tables, rents these two side rooms at the, what was that, the Hotel Pennsylvania across the street from the Madison Square Gardens. I mean, this is our first encounter with uh, the concept of unions. They were charging 35 cents a box mm -hmm. to get your stuff in, but you couldn't use a cart, so we had to hand carry our little box. And we had stupidly had, like, all these little boxes. You know, next year we showed up with, like, big, big boxes. You want 35 cents? Well, okay, asshole. You know, like, yeah. This one's 200 pounds, you know. We had to lift that one. Um, excuse me, I didn't mean to yeah. swear. But anyways, it's like, because um, the 70 show there uh, in, in New York, that's where I encountered more and more artwork that I was buying, but no, a lot of people weren't into it and stuff like this. We sold a pile of stuff, um, and then that was July, and around that same time, a short while later, we'd been in New York, drove back in the 65 Chevy with that U-Haul trailer, and then we're going to San Diego for the first one there that got to test out what's happening there. That was at the U.S. Grant Hotel, mm -hmm. and... I guess and, about, and how did you find out about the San Diego Con? How these were all being advertised in RBCC, yeah. this Rockets Blast well, comic. Was there electric. a lot of like word of mouth and that sort of thing? GB too? Love, no, yeah. no, 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 no. GB Love with RBCC, okay. Rockets Blast comic collector. Um, you want to learn the you know, the this evolution of this comics business? It would behoove the University of San Diego or the name of your or San Diego State, yeah, San Diego yeah. State to acquire a run of RBCC okay. and somebody sit down and read this stuff. I mean, there's a, it's got news about the comics. There's also the comics reader. It has the, the whole, the, the output of the industry coming out, unfolding month by month. Right. And But this advertising thing, all the fanzines were, I mean, it was the center of the universe. 
it was a couple thousand. He grew, he grew up to 22, 2400 people by 1970, and then he um, he stopped listening more at subscribers in the. Mm -hmm. I mean, the origins of the direct sales market are inside RBCC. They want to credit Phil Suling and Bud Plant and all this other stuff. GB Love starts something called Ye Old Fanzine Shop in number 60, 61. And he's advertising there, publishing a, a higher quality fanzine. It's like just send him your best price. You can sell 50 to 100 copies of. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you can buy you know, 20, 30 different fanzines from one guy paying one postage charge. So, you know, Bud Plant get an idea for selling this stuff. Phil Suling get yeah. it, it all boils back down to this GB Love thing that's been marginalized. It's lost to history. Yeah. I'm working on a book called Comic Book Star Wars that I hope to alleviate and and um, point out these these hundreds of people that were friends of mine back in the day, and a lot of them are dead now. Um, yeah, GB Love was in a car accident in Houston, Texas. Um, but when we get out to that San Diego Comic Con, it's our, that's yeah, actually where, where I met Jack Kirby for the first okay. time. That's where uh, Ray Bradbury was there and stuff like that. And yeah, Ray Bradbury is kind of funny because over the, those next few years, I kept met, meeting him at San Diego Comic Cons and we'd go out to LA shows and stuff from Fremont, Nebraska still. Mm -hmm. And he'd always write a, go out there and he'd be writing a check for like two, three, four dollars. You know, and I, mean, I didn't cash it. And, and then, but I noticed over a few years there, I, I, he would never write a check for more than five dollars. And I asked him one day, Ray, wait. You never write a check. You never buy more than like five bucks from anybody. Why, why is that? He says, "Well, I found out from his bank statement." He said that if he writes a check for more than five dollars, they'll cash it. But <laughs> under five dollars, they don't. Ca he was getting all this free stuff because people want the autograph. Yeah. It was worth two or three dollars. Oh right. But right. you know, two or three dollars forty years ago, you could actually get a good pile of stuff. Yeah. yeah. You know, people had nickel and ten cent boxes at shows. And he's a comic book collector okay. and a pulp collector. I mean, yeah, he, I mean, he was a fan of all this stuff, like a lot of other people. And, you know, it's, yeah. Um, well, yeah, could you tell us a little bit more about that first San Diego Con? What was the atmosphere like? What, uh, what, you know, what was the demographic of, of the people that was there, of the it people like that all, were there? It was all guys except, like, a couple women. Yeah. It was just, and a lot of younger, you know, upper teenagers, young 20s. I think Shell was like what thirty one. Yeah, had you met Shell before at the no. Triple Fan no. or at any of the other places? You'd when been I got there in sixty nine, yeah. he had already moved out. That's right to San Diego because he was with the Triple Fanfare earlier on. Like up until sixty eight, okay. so he he had he had split. I didn't really know of Shell okay. then. He hadn't started any of these interviews that were being published yet, and stuff like that. He had moved out for whatever reason that he moved out for. I'm, eludes me right at this moment in time. And then he fell in with you know the, these these comic collecting things and stuff like that, yeah. and they started talking to each other about putting on some sort of show. He had already had experience for three or four years being connected in with the Detroit Triple Fanfare, um, and then they made a, 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 a historic trip up there. I, mean, I think they were all in Richard Alf's Volkswagen. A bunch of them all yeah. jammed into the sucker and went up to visit Jack Kirby. Yeah. So I've then they're asking story, Jack yeah. Kirby if they'd, uh, if they would, um, if he'd be a guest at this thing. And Jack Kirby had just recently moved out to, I believe, Thousand Oaks at this point. Okay. He had just recently um, wised up that Marvel's never really going to ever pay royalties. Yeah, and I want to touch on Jack Kirby talking about because he almost was he was supposed to walk with Ditko, thinking there'll be a pair paralyzing Marvel back in 66 mm -hmm. over the concept of royalties because Kirby now yeah, I'm jumping the gun here but we gotta we gotta touch that okay, okay. um we gotta realize that, I mean all these shows I've been I've set up yeah Booth, booths, tables, whatever, at over a thousand comic books. Yeah, well, shows. how did that first con so, that you went, the uh, first San Diego con, how did that compare to some of the other cons you've been doing? I liked like, it. The I mean, the, 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 the uh, you're, you're in New York in July. It's hot there. Yeah. I mean, it's miserable hot. Chicago is miserable hot in the summertime. Houston, miserable hot. You got San Diego, 70 degrees. <laughs> it's like, yes, you know. So, and this, this is where the growing process is, and I want to get into. In 70, at that first one, and then the second one we drove out to, I think, was on a, the campus uh, and stayed oh, in the, the dorm. Oh, the one they had at UCSD. In 71. Yeah. Now, that was the second one and stuff mm -hmm. like this. Um, but 
in in seventy, yeah, we we did that one, and then I did another show. I'm not remembering right this second that summer. But anyways, at this point, I'm like enrolling in the school and stuff like this, and I'm running the this. Uh, and that was back in Nebraska, where you were yeah. going to school, yeah. And then also with, at this antiquarian bookstore, it's he had, he had I mean these Captain Marvel giveaways, this Pop Wheat headquarters that was in the basement. I set that guy up with a actual comic book store trip going on. It was the first comic book store in Omaha. And uh, by this point, I'm going to UNL, University of Nebraska at Lincoln. And I'm trying to run a remote control from you know, 50 miles away and coming in there on weekends or whenever and stuff like this. And there was a couple of local fans and stuff like that that kind of muscled, weaseled their way in. Uh, one of them apologized to me years later, that it's et cetera over some they could be there and I, I just couldn't but I, but setting the guy up and stuff like that um and then I ended up making like no money out of any aspect of this so you know it's a learning process as you get older and older of what the term altruism might yeah. mean or might not mean and stuff yeah. like this and not thinking of what other people's perceptions of that might be but in you getting into 71 um go to New York City again um, back, it's back down in 71 it's back down to Dallas that summer and stuff like that but in 71 I, I, we're meeting up I mean Bud Planner meeting up he's going to the shows Some of the, most of the other San Jose guys aren't mm -hmm. at this point um, and I saw meeting up and then doing this little caravan thing that kind of cranks up in 71 that gets really more organized we're planning it out in 72 was trying to save money in between the shows or during the shows on when back when motel sixes were actually six bucks <laughs> well okay three bucks each and at one point we had like 10 guys all like all in one room it was like 75 cents each a night or you know it was yeah it was just all about saving money on the road the gas was 20 cents a piece but these monies added up because we're all of us are we're, you know upper teenagers early you know, early 20s is saving up money to go to college and that's where the brain was at in, with a lot of us so in 71 this thing's still growing it's still running ads in, in the in the rbcc but then ellen light started coming out with something called um the buyer's guide for comics fandom which starts out monthly it's supposed to be free for lifetime subscriptions but that changed and then stan's weekly express starts up and in, in, in so there's more competition for gb love with his rbcc and um at some point he sells it to james van heiss and he just wants to get out of this. He's hard to c compete. He's got cerebral palsy. And he, uh, but if we jump into 72, no, 71 and stuff like this, this is when we're more organized. We're in the main room. We sent the money in way early and stuff like this. Um, we didn't know when we sent the money in for 1970, suing New York City show that he didn't bother cashing the checks because he'd already sold out the room. I mean, just a bunch of us just showed up anyways. Oh, wow. I mean, just assumed. Well, you know, it, just, it, it all worked out. Yeah. But uh, it was all a growing process. Suling had to move it to a, a bigger venue in 72 because, I mean, the, the show was exponentially growing, but it was miserably hot in Manhattan, yeah. even with all the comic book companies there. And the 70-71 show is me, guys like me and Bud Plant were... Um, all, doing all these back east shows in addition to coming out for San Diego we're telling all these back east dealers no you want to come out to San Diego the, it's weather's better <laughs> I mean you, you didn't want to leave the hotel in New York I mean in San Diego you didn't want to go back in the hotel you just want to go down to the beach yeah. that mentality you know what I'm saying it was like just so much better here which is why everybody wants to live here right because yeah. it's the weather etc nothing new there right uh, so um, it, but in 71 We'd been to this Dallas show and stuff like this, and Robert Brown and Don Maris out of an old pharmacy out of Tulsa and stuff like that. This guy had never thrown away any newspapers. There was this basement full of old newspapers. Long story short, there, they bought the, all these newspapers in the basement, whatever they paid for it, probably almost nothing. Just, you know, basically to empty out the thing, all these old newspapers, but they pulled out all the Sunday comic sections and all the daily strips, and then they ripped all the s Sunday sections apart, and they had big old giant stack of Prince Valiant, big old stack of, you know, and we're talking six to ten of each of 
every Prince of Iron from like early 1938 to early 1950s, just every one, because wow. he never returned any of the newspapers. Um, but we didn't get the Flash Gordons with Raymond. I loved Hal Foster. Just so we bought those. We, I don't know what we paid. Fifty cents a piece per page for the 1930s, and then 25 cents a page. We just bought them all. And then two weeks later, we're in New York City. Had this big old stack. We had three tables. We had a big table full of Disney, Walt Disney artifacts from the 1930s. I mean, somewhere in Nebraska, I'd found, come across unopened rolls of Walt Disney wallpaper. I mean, just with all the you know, long bill Donald Duck and oh, Mickey wow. Mouse, and Goofy. I mean, all the Disney characters that were coming up by then was on all this wallpaper. There was wall trim also, and Fantasia planners, these glazed things. It was just a table full of this stuff. Had a table full of comic books, and then table full, well, half a table full with these Prince Viants and then some of the other Sunday. Pa- oh yeah, we bought all the Crazy Cats too, these tabloid Crazy Cats for fifty cents a page. Um, one of those Crazy Cats, we had like thirty of. Those were tabloid size. Um, oh yeah, with the Crazy Cats and at a same thing with the tabloid. Uh, Wins- Windsor McKay's son, Robert McKay, had been cutting up. Little Nemo's in the late '40s, and recycling them. So they was a, that ran for like a year, two years in, in, the tabloid newspapers, the Sunday, or basically Saturday ones, which, which would have, um, comic strips in that would be different than the Sunday ones, which were your like prime time, and then mm-hmm. so Little Nemo reruns were considered probably B. Crazy Cat at the back in the days was considered more of a B strip. Never never made it into the Sunday sections. Not looking back, they want to say Crazy Cat's the greatest comic strip ever made, but back when it was new, it, it was never, in its lifetime, you put an aggregate together, maybe 40 newspapers carried Crazy Cat, maybe 6 to 10 at a time. It only lived because Hearst loved Crazy Cat. Okay. So Hearst kept it alive. Paid Harriman whatever he paid him and never made any money off of Harriman, but it just, um, I'm one of the guys that, Proved that Harriman was black man born out in New Orleans, based off of the the clincher proof. I mean, one of them was somebody discovered his birth certificate out of New Orleans, listing him as mulatto. But I started actively looking down for photographs of him without his hat on. Um, and this 1902 one, he's 20 years old, 22, 20. Anyways, he's standing. It's a portrait shot, and he's standing proudly standing there in a. In a t- my suit and stuff like that, and you can see the waves in there. That's a black person's hair that's been slicked down. Yeah. That ran that ran in all the Jeep here, and Chris Ware edited Van de Graphics books. I allowed those photographs, all my Crazy Cat artifacts, which are really rare, to be run in those books okay. so they'd be seen. Back when my hip joints were all messed up, and I didn't think I was ever going to get anything done ever again. But in 71, we had this big stack of Prince Vance. Guy comes up, he's looking through the Prince Vance, and he was mentioning that he had um, glued, cut apart all the Prince Vance panels into scrapbooks and rubber cement. And the rubber cement stains were coming through 20 years later. And he was going to buy one of each. He's looking through, he's, well, it's a couple hours, he's looking through, pulling out the best one, printing examples out of all these ones. And at this time, Roy Crinkle walks up. He's, you know, he's, and he's, Starts saying, yeah, I, I taught Al Williamson everything he knows and stuff like this. And he had drawn all the EC science fiction Wil- Williamson stories he had drawn up in pen, no pencil. Detailed preliminary drawing of every panel that was ever in a Al Williamson Frazetta EC story, like ever. And he had all these preliminary panels. He wanted 50 cents a, pay, a panel. We bought like 100 of them. Like, oh, we love Al Williamson. And these are way cool too, Mr. Crinkle. But we didn't know anything about Roy Crinkle then other than he'd done some of the paintings for some of the boroughs and some illustrations inside those ace paperback covers. That's the only thing I really knew about Crinkle then. And about this time, a woman walks up, and she's, like, looking at all this Disney stuff. And um, she says, yeah, we just moved to East Strasburg, Pennsylvania, and we want to – I want to do my kitchen in Disneyana. So she picks out all that wallpaper, and she picks out a bunch of these, you know, um, Disney glaze pottery things that we'd have been accumulating and other Disney artifacts, toys, I mean, pull toys and just neat things – but it comes out to like $3,000. And about this time, when the guy's getting done looking through the Prince Vance, and we'd been gushing about Al Williamson, he says, well, you want to trade for some Al Williamson art? And we're still like really stupid, and we don't realize. And he comes back with a portfolio, and then it dawns on us, well, this is Al Williamson himself, <laughs> that this guy Roy Crinkle's been razzing all this time, and we're just oblivious. And the three of them are talking, this woman, 
Al Williamson. We pick out like 60 or so Secret Agent Corrigan dailies and some older 1950s comic book pages and stuff like this for these Prince Valiants. And we're like really happy. He's really happy. It didn't cost him nothing in terms of money. And about this time, they're done, and the woman just kind of look, looks at me and Steve and goes, well, go up to room 320. I think it was either 312 or 320. And tell my husband you have $3,000 worth of trade credit and turns around and walks away. The three of them walk away talking. And that was the first hour or so or two of the first day of a suing show. you know. And so we got a potential $3,000 sale. We got all these crinkle EC preliminaries. And we got a, this big pile of Williamson art. And all of Thursday goes by. And we're wheeling and dealing. Tony Goodstone that did this book called The Pulps. Uh, reprint stories and stuff like that with a really cool cover um, that had come out from Chelsea House in 1970. He's sitting right next to us with a table, and he's got stuff like Superman, the, the rollover plane, the rollover tank, I mean, in the boxes. I mean, just all yeah. these incredible comic character rare toys that we're getting an education off of learning from that, plus a big table full of old pulp magazines, Weird Tales, that were like, as we're making money, we're like buying old 1920s and 30s Weird Tales, getting... Oh geez, what, December 1932, first appearance of Conan, in a in a weird tales yeah. pulp. I did by this, you know, like I don't know, four dollars, you know, <laughs> Spear and Fang from 1925, his very first story. I think that was like six bucks, you know, yeah. with these beautiful Mar well, then these Margaret Brundage covers we're discovering and Virgil Finley covers, a whole new education in the pulp field from this guy next door. Anyways. Well, Friday afternoon, about 2 o'clock, you know, we hadn't seen this woman and her husband at all. And I'm like, I'm going to go upstairs and you know, talk to this husband and stuff like this. And Steve, as I'm walking off, sees, make sure you get that money. We need this for college. And I go upstairs, up the elevator, knock on the door, but it, but it's like swings open. And then on one wall, there's like all these Edgar Rice Burroughs, Tarzan and stuff, uh, John, I mean, all these Prezetta paintings for the cup, paperback covers and on this other wall are all the worn creepy and eerie paintings and stuff like that. on this other wall like secret gardens all these miscellaneous paintings and this table in the middle big table were all the johnny comet sundays and dailies not the three tier earlier ones but the two tier sundays were all there and then all the dailies I mean, we're talking monster stacks of, of yeah. johnny comet dailies that ran for a, a few years before he started doing the little abner gig for all those years nine years he did that Anyways, and I, meant, I, I walk up to I introduce myself. Oh, you're, you're, you're the guy that, you know, bamboozled my wife, you know, about <laughs> getting all this stuff that we're going to, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he was being good natured about it. Yeah, he was, yeah. you know, man, I'm like, not knowing what was going on and stuff like yeah. that. And I go, uh, so I'm looking at the, the two tier Sundays. They're $100 a Sunday. But the dailies were 35 bucks each, or three for $100. So I thought to myself, I end up with more Frazetta if I get the three for $100 dailies. That was what the trip was, was just getting more art yeah. on a net basis and stuff like that. So I'm, I got 90 of these I can pick out. So I'm like going through the stacks and pulling one out, pulling one out. And I get down to like about 80 to go. I mean, I'm about 10 left to go yeah. out of this 90. And I see one and I pull one back. And then I did that a few times. And all of a sudden, Frank goes, hey, they're all good. <laughs> <laughs> And I did it a couple more times before I got the the hint sunk in, you know. That, uh, you know, and then I just I, did, I stopped doing that, and I was just caught up in the like, you know, because I could have got a painting. They were like two, three dollars, two or three thousand dollars, maybe you know, four thousand dollars a painting. I mean, yeah. anyone I wanted at that point in time. Then I thought to myself, no, Steve and I are going to probably end up not being friends anymore because we're going to fight over who's going to end up with the Rosetta painting. Yeah. So I, I thought, well, we can split these up easier than a painting. I'll probably rip it in half or something like that. Would be the, only, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Not that we would, but that'd be like the, the only logical Solomon solution of yeah. like cutting the baby in half, right? <laughs> so I got the dailies. I come walking back down. I got this under my arm, and Steve says, "You didn't get any money, did you?" And I go, mm, "I got something better than money." Is what I said. Yeah. Yep, I got something better than money. And um, anyways. At the end of the show, Russ Cochran got all the rest of them on consignment and immediately made them all the dailies, 100 bucks each. So our three grand became nine grand, yeah. theoretically, because Russ Cochran had decreed it so. You know, he was really upset because I had really cherry-picked at it, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A few of them he really wanted. So he got all those, and he's swapping me, you know, two or three for a couple each for a couple of the ones that I had in that, my stash and 
Yeah. Anyway, so this is now that some that summer seven, and then a few weeks later, we've been in New York, and then it's back all across the whole country, back to San Diego for this one there. So we were armed with Williamson artwork, we're armed with Frazetta artwork. Uh, at the '69 St. World's Louis World Convention, I said this guy was walking around, you know. And we'd gone upstairs, and there was this room full of artwork. We got sidetracked when one of the interruptions happened. Um, and there we ended up with there's two guys from New York City, um, remain nameless, uh, because, like I said, the stuff was, uh, they were giving it away. It was, they were talking about artwork being thrown away. But, you know, about the whole book of X-Men 58, the Havoc issue, five bucks a page. Bought chapters of Spectre, Dead Men, um, five bucks a page. Bought Neil Adams' very first work at DC was inking a Joe Kubert story, backup story out of like Our Army at War in the 180s, early 180s, 183. Five bucks a page. Got a, a cover, Jerry Lewis cover that Neil Adams had drawn. I mean, we weren't the first ones in there. Mm-hmm. I mean, but so a lot of the other, most of the other X Men stuff was all gone, but that complete book, X Men 58, was still there. Got X Men, the cover of X Men '63, Magneto with a, some time warp thing on the front cover. Ten bucks. Covers were ten bucks. Wow. We ended up with seventy-five Neil Adams pages, um, sixty or so Ditko pages out of Creeper and Hawk and Dove, um, Kirby pages, um, fifteen to twenty or so Kurt Swan Superman action covers. They were only five dollars a page. Wow. I mean, and we just we spent all our money. That we were making downstairs, which wasn't a whole lot, but it was well over a thousand dollars. We spent it all on artwork there, as so we had that stuff that we were like hauling around, and we, uh, yeah, came home on gas fumes from that St. Louis thing. And this, at this point, it wasn't the Rambler Classic. I had a Corvair, one with the engine in the back, holding oh, yeah. by a bolt right. that Ralph Nader wrote about, and yeah. one of those unsafe at any speed. Unsafe, <laughs> yeah, and it was like loaded down to the gills, and all this artwork, and uh, yeah, on our, on our drive out to. Um, um, that 71, sec, the second San Diego show and stuff like that. We were reading our stuff, right? I mean, we'd been reading like uh, the windows were down. It was, you know, hot out there in the desert and stuff like that. And I think, I, I don't remember if I was driving or Steve was driving, but one of us was driving. Another one was reading a Thunder Number 1. It had put it down, but then the wind blew it open when the, the ice chest was open. Uh-huh. So this Thunder Number 1, like, went into the ice chest. And oh. There it was. And, you know, I mean... Stuff happens. You yeah. know? <laughs> it's just like, yeah, we were pretty bummed out. We were like really bummed. Why did it have to be a Thunder One? <laughs> you know, and uh, but we had four copies of it. So oh, okay, at the time. So I mean, it's all relative, and it was probably um, what was it worth then? It was still worth about fifty bucks. Anyways, so getting into going to school and stuff like that, making more ads and stuff like this, going through college at UNL for the freshman year, and then uh, summer seventy. And then been, been 71, going through more college and stuff like that, coming into 72, stuff like that. Bud Plant and I have actually communicated um, more so because we were talk, I had talked about it the previous year, and um, we had agreed to and do you were it. In Nebraska. Where was Bud at that time? He was San Jose. He still lived with his parents in, okay, at, uh, on Holly Drive okay. in San Jose. He'd cranked up. Underground comics were, were coming up in 68. So in 69, he brought, with 70, he brought up a whole bunch of uh, print zaps and freak brothers to the Multicon and almost got busted by the Oklahoma police. The Oklahoma City police got wind of this. And, yeah, that trunk. Mm-hmm. He had this metal trunk with the undergrounds in it. Yeah, it was like the padlock was put on it, shoved under somewhere and hidden, you know. And he was literally selling them under, from under yeah. the table, as it were. Because there were still these crazy Christian types yeah. that you know, save the youth of America from comic books. You know, Robert Crumb is gonna like subvert. Um, but, anyways, um, in '72 we did this caravan thing where it started out Multicon of '72 in Oklahoma City again, okay. and then the first Chicago show was held before the people that did that long one before it got sold to Wizard. That long run of shows: Gary Kulabano, Larry Sherratt, and Bob Weinberg and a woman named Nancy it was either Nancy Ford or Nancy Warner. One of those ladies was involved with that crowd, but two years before the very first 
Chicago show was held at Pickport Congress Hotel. Russ Heath was the guest there because he was the only local artist in Chicago at the time. So it was like a no, but we did that. It was a Detroit show. There was one in Atlantic City. There was one in New York City. There was this uh, convention, the first time that convention promoters had kind of gotten together. So idiots like me and Bud could like, you know, hit these shows without like crisscrossing all over the place and in 71, a couple of them were on the same weekend. You had a pick. So this was actually an actual convention, what do you want to call it, a, a circuit okay. was being developed where, you know, down the road here, you know, as San Diego grew bigger, whenever they picked their date, either in July or August, then New York had to follow in. So these other smaller promoters had to wait for San Diego or, or soothing yeah. and stuff to pick their dates. But in 72, that's down the road, though. That, that's still quite a few years down the road before that started happening. But in 72, we're doing this tour and uh, this circuit. You know, and that's, that, that's that year when eight to ten of us were, like, in one room for 75 cents a night. And we were cutting cards to see who got the box springs, the mattress, <laughs> the pillows, the, the uh, pillow cases off the pillows, those sheets, the blanket. I mean, the whole nine yards was cut, cart and cut, cards down the way. None of all of us were still too stupid to figure out how to bring a pillow and a blanket from the car, or even just sleep in the car. But the, the cars were full of comics. I mean, there was no yeah. room. You know, you'd be sleeping with your steering wheel like this because the rest of it was all full of books. And uh, and then as you're going through these shows, you're picking up even more books. So you're actually traveling with more than you left with. And we got yeah, we had to like spot in each other because there was constant tires popping. You know, from trying to figure out, you know, buying retread tires, you know, in high school, you know, coming out of high school, you're, you're still thinking stupid thoughts of the best way, just buy it really good, six-ply tires and be done with it. No, no, kept buying, blowing out tires, so we were spotting each other. Bud's van was way overloaded, and there was a lot of blowouts. And, uh, but um, when we, when it, doing all that, that circuit and stuff like that, the final show for that summer, of comic book shows was mid-August in August 15th or so uh, in San Diego. And it's the first El Cortez show. It moved into this thing here. Um, other people can explain how it got there. All I know, it, it was there, yeah. you know. And that's where we're supposed to show up. And I get there. This is before they built that dealer's room across the street, which was, and went out to the airport for the next year, then was back at the El Cortez. And, um, I get there and stuff like this, and me and Bud have been promoting heavily to all those back east dealers. You know, the New York show, I mean, it's all those, you're going to have more guests and stuff like that, but it's so damn hot, you know, in New York in the summertime with the humidity coming off the ocean and stuff like that. San Diego, it's like way better and blah, blah, blah. So during all that thing there, it was like all these back east dealers like bought all these tables at the Comic Con, so by the time I, I'm getting out there, uh, Richard Alf didn't have a record of me ever paying for my table, except I had the cancel check in my wallet by happenstance, and uh, I think Mike. Well, some some say, people at least remember. You had that one, unlike the when you went to New York. Pardon? No. I said at least he had cashed it, and you had the proof because I remember you told me you went to New York and the check hadn't been cashed. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the, nothing was. You know, this yeah. is you know, those organization years where this hobby yeah. was getting out of hand. For a number of us, and we didn't realize it was actually turning into a business until, which I'm going to get to here in, in two shakes. So I get out there, he doesn't have it, and the room is just jammed full of, you know, where would all these dealers come from? And we're seeing all these back east dealers and stuff like that. And I go, okay, now I understand. It's like sometimes you can, like, talk to a good thing up too much yeah. and it comes back and careful for what you wish for, you know, and it comes back and shoots you in the foot. You know, um, I mean, I'm not, but the only reason that we were promoting the hell out of the sh San Diego Comic Con is this dedicated group that was fans were getting all these really cool guests and people showing up from Hollywood and stuff like that. And, you know, Kirby moved out there, you know, it, Ray Bradbury's there every year and et cetera, et cetera. So it's like that Field of Dreams, uh, Kevin Costner movie, you, you, you know, you, you build it, they will come. So. Yeah. We talked to all these people to coming in, and it's like I didn't have. I mean, Bud was up on this stage. He was really mad. Man, well, not really mad, but he was. Like, yeah, he was pretty pissed off that that first morning. He has to haul up all his boxes as a four, four stairs to get up onto the set of three tables up on this stage up where he's up all by himself. So he had like all this action is going on. He's back up 
you know, to get to and hard to. But Richard solves the problem with my booth, with, with my table and stuff. Like he walks into the next room next down the way. He comes back with his giant round table like this one was huge. And it's right in the door. You had to, like, squeeze around my thing to anybody else. I mean, people remember that. Right? Go, that was me there and yeah. stuff like that, blah, blah, blah. So that, that 72 show, and then we get into, after the show, Bud had been selling. His friend John Barrett had been running his mail order business for two months. He owed Bud, John Bud owed him $2,000 because he'd taken in $20,000. And Bud wanted, asked me for my help to go up north with him to try to figure out how to do what John Barrett wanted to buy into Bud's mail order business, but didn't want to do that. But I'd had this conversation with Will Eisner at this point, two months earlier at the Multicon in Oklahoma city, where I'd met him at six 30 morning on my way to the restaurant, never got there. We started talking about how to save the American comic book after we were going through spirit sections that I had under my arm to read and comic books had just gone to 20 cents and people were stopping reading comics and Will had suggested in the conversation that a bunch of enterprising young guys should open up stores, comic book store, as close to a college campus as possible. So I'm relating this back to Bud and John when I'm up there and stuff like this, trying to defuse because John really wants to buy in. They've been partners before in mm -hmm. two comic book stores, Seven Sons, which was one of the first ones ever to open up in the country, but it was only open for the summer for a few months. Then they were back in high school. And then Comic World, where they, uh, Frank Scadina had been brought in as a partner because this one actually had a business license, but he was the only, because he needed him as an adult because the rest of them were all underage to even buy a, a city business license. Um, it was seven of them. Or, but Comic World, no, there was like three or four. But anyway, so then John has sold out everything. He had nine Frazetta originals that he traded for a 10-speed bike for his wife. You know, he's working at Lucky's Grocery Store as a, you know, assistant grocery manager in the section of a Lucky's gro Grocery Store. So anyway, so this was all in a, related was begging me to stay out here and stuff like the out there and stuff like that so we got to talking go up to telegraph avenue in berkeley and because we're scoping out where, what would be the good one well you see berkeley would be good so we drive up to telegraph found an empty storefront right where dwight way and telegraph come together which is there it's 500 a month and we talked to the landlord and stuff so thousand dollars moving in first and last month's rent and i think 200 that was twelve hundred dollars and getting the phone turned on and then getting the electricity turned on other incidentals berkeley business license all that kind of stuff chews up most of john's money that bud owes john for the 10 percent that he was making from running bud's mail order business for two months and then bud puts in two thousand dollars wholesale value of merchandise and we get all this set up oh yeah bud had also said to me to um the world, L.A. Worldcon was going to be that weekend, you know, two weeks after San Diego, and so we we get to come. We can actually get that store set up. I mean, this takes three or four days. We get to actually get the store set up in a week, and then Bud and I come back down for the L.A. Worldcon. Was out at the airport, LAX, and uh, God, comic the science fiction fans were still dissing us. This is where Scott Shaw dresses up as the turd. Terry oh. Stroud's the P.T. Barnum character. A guy named Bob Cole is a plumber. We're trying to figure out, it was like 40 of us comic fans and stuff like that, um, trying to figure out how to get back at science fiction fans. And one thing was their masquerade thing. So, I mean, um, Scott Shaw, I mean, it was, he was like, it was like $20 worth of Skippy peanut butter you know, was bought. And he's like, that's all he had on except for a, a, this big leotard. He didn't. You know, he's, he's more svelte then. But it was just a leotard on him. It was completely nothing else except this big layer of peanut butter. And then these, these hot lights and stuff like this, because this is all being filmed, being shown through the hotel on closed circuit TV. So this hot lights and stuff starts melting. Stuff. And Scott's just flinging this stuff, this peanut butter. It's going out into the crowd. And Terry would come out in advance going, from the depths of Uranus. You know, something wonder of the world, blah, blah, blah. And he's just going on and on with all these metaphors and yeah. stuff like this. And then Scott comes, argh! And all his comic fans were down and right in the front row, which is kind of a mistake because we were getting splattered with this peanut butter being shot out all over the place. And, and Bob Cole, he's like dressed up as a plumber. He's got a plunger and stuff like that. So he's like pushing on Scott Sean Lee. He's taking the stuff that's in there. And then he's flinging it out into the crowd, going all over the place. They got so pissed at us. But you know what? I think we earned the respect because they stopped dissing comic book fans after that LAX Worldcon. 
like they had been 69 i mean all through there and um so anyway so that first el cortez show that energy off of that thing it's like that thing was so jammed and all that stuff was in there and it opens up on a, i don't know on a thursday or something like that and there's people down there and then there's friends calling up their la friends all right by saturday you know other collectors who weren't going to make this 90 mile trek down there and so all that it's just jammed full of people and that's where i met tom french um i think his virginia's wife his, her father had just died he wanted to get away i was like the first person he talked to after he bought his ticket because i'm everybody had to talk to me with this i mean richard felt so bad that he you know, he, he did. I mean, it was all cool. You know, it's like I wasn't upset. I'm just like, well, I go, Richard, I don't have gas money to get home. I got to set up somewhere. I got to yeah. at least sell something somewhere and stuff. I don't care where you put me up. I don't care. You know, I, my books will sell themselves. I had, a, you know, I had all this artwork. I had Neil Adams stuff. I had Williamson stuff. I had all this artwork I was describing, plus even more stuff that was just accumulating and hitting all the antique shops in the you know, from Des Moines, Iowa, all the way, you know, like 100 miles around Fremont, 150 miles around Kansas City, I was going down there, just scoring stuff up. By this point, also, in January 71, the, uh, well, when I, went, when I was down there at UNL, it was a friend of mine who'd become a journalism major, and he, we did this interview, he wrote up his very first journalism story, it was in two-page spread about me, two full pages in the Sunday Omaha World Herald ran about me with photographs of me, Hold, they, the photographer wanted uh, my oldest comic book, picture of me holding it, my most valuable comic book, what I was most proud of, and stuff. And then color photographs of, on one page of uh, Mar some Marvel mystery comic book, a Plastic Man police comic book, um, a Wiz comic with Captain Marvel, and a thing down there. And they chopped out about a third of the article because well, that was on one, the other full page with these little black and white photos of me showing the stuff. But... I got all this stuff in. That was January 71. So I, the collections were coming in. Yeah. Now I got that idea of getting newspaper coverage and stuff like that from Leonard Brown and Ma Malcolm Willits from back in February 66 when they had this trunk they supposedly bought at this unclaimed storage place and they were showing Superman 1 and Action 1 and the collections were coming in from them for them. So, yeah, I mean, I'm learning from all these adults without going to business school yet and yeah. stuff like that. But we opened up that, that first store. Yeah, and, and when did you open that store? What was the date it was, on that? Uh, a week to 10 days after the 72 uh, uh, San Diego El Cortez show. Okay. Driven up within 10 days. It's still three or four days before the L.A. World Con. Whatever that, I don't okay. remember that. So that it's kind of in between the San Diego. It's Rock exactly Rock. in between. I mean, leaning more towards when the World Con was that weekend. And... Um, I'm still begging off at this point. I helped them open it up. Uh, Bud's just begging the hell out of me to, to stay there because John didn't know anything. He'd been out of new com out of comic yeah. book business for the for the comic books, I'm not dealing just undergrounds on a mail order out of a catalog. But the, what the prices were jumping, he was two years out of touch, yeah. and a lot of things had changed. I mean, Spider-Man One was no longer like four or five dollars. Right. It was more like twenty bucks. You know, yeah. things like that where he wouldn't have no idea what he was doing, and I knew exactly what I was doing, and. Um, I go, no, 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 my parents, I mean, you're going to continue going to school. You want me to work with John. Your parents would get mad if you quit school and started working in the store. My parents would lynch me if I, like, just all of a sudden quit. But then I'm, I'm helping them, helping them, helping them, realizing when, when I finally leave to go back to UNL, I'm like, Dad, don't worry. It's like, you know, I'll be, I am going to be the first beer bomb to graduate from college, okay, which was really important to that World War II generation that their kids get into college and get graduated. Yeah. It just was for everybody, for a lot of people. So I realized I could make it back for late registration, and things were going good. I had three days, four days to get back for registration, get some classes. School's going to start. You're realizing that if, if the classes, a lot of people drop out that first week. So I, I knew I could end up where I wanted to be, even though I just signed up for something. But I picked up a hitchhiker, Sparks, Nevada, the rest stop up at the top. In my 65 Chevy Impala, which speedometer went up to 140 miles an hour, 120, I think it was 140, with the U-Haul trailer in the back, I picked up, I, I, I interviewed hitchhikers there and stuff like that who could drive, because I needed to drive straight through, Yeah. and I'm pretty beat. And Western Nevada, I uh, um, wake up to this tremendous boosh in the car, just 
guy blew up my engine. I quickly look over to the speedometer. He buried it. I could not see the the little red thing on the speedometer. He was going over in, in excess of 120 miles an hour. Blew up my engine. And I have very rarely told this part of the thing that, but I had a machete underneath the seat, and I was so crazed, lack of sleep. It was like three or four in the morning. I got the machete out and started chasing him down the road <laughs> with his backpack and his guitar in my back seat. And I was, I don't know what I was going to do. I. I don't know what I was going to do, but he got scared, and I wasn't seeing right. And I, all I knew was like, oh, no, I'm now not going to get back to school. My, my parents yeah. are going to be mad at me, you know. So it took me two days to get uh, somebody, to hitchhiker, to stop and pick me up because I didn't know there was a prison in western Nevada there where big oh, signs that say, don't right, pick up right. hitchhikers because they might be an escaped felon. So I'm sitting there like a half a mile down from that sign. And, you know, somebody finally stops picks me up, gets me into Wells, Nevada. Um, from there, they, they make phone calls. They find an engine for like 500 bucks in Salt Lake City. And I had to wait for the, the, the bus coming through twice a day. And I got a bus. I had to, I had to call up my parents going, get, you know, all that money that I sent on, what, you know, Western Union for you to put in my bank account. Yeah. You know, because I didn't want to be carrying all that cash. So uh, I, I need you to send me like back out $1,000. The engine was like 500 bucks. I had to pay somebody $200 to drive it from Salt Lake City, 100 and some odd mile to whatever it is out to Wells, Nevada, you know, with this engine and it, on the flatbed, big truck. Yeah. You know. Anyway, then it took a few more days for them to put the engine in, get it, and then I had to seat it in. I'm in school registration. I call up Bud going, hey, it looks like I'm going to sit out the semester and I'm coming back. He and I set up housekeeping uh, roommates with, with a Japanese friend of his named Fred and uh, sharing this three-bedroom house and the big master bedroom becomes Rick Bud's mail order business, and I start working in the store. I, mean, I was just gonna sit out the semester and work in the store, but this store that I was in on ground floor was getting up off the ground, and we um, go along for about two months. It's not, not mid-November. John, for, for whatever reason, had worked up a debt to Bud off the fanzine posters for Zeta World Beater posters and stuff, underground comics, of like $3,000. And Bud's father was all over Bud. You know, it was no more good money after bad, okay? So Bud told that to John. So a huge argument going on in that, in that, at 458 Harmony Lane. And I'm just sitting there watching John and Bud and their friendships disintegrating. And I could see the potential. Bud was never working in those stores for the comics and comics, even for the first whole bunch of years. It was hard when we incorporated later on after the four stores. We couldn't even get him to come to the the, the quarterly uh, corporate meetings. He's getting busy on working on his degree, but California law stipulated you got a corporation. You know, corp, you know, the stockholders got to get together for corporate meeting, keep minutes, and all. We couldn't even get him to come to those things. His mind has evolved since then. But you know, it's it, that's okay. I mean, I'm sure some of my stuff might have ha has evolved over the years yeah. too, and stuff like this. But this is this is key and pivotal and stuff like this because, in terms of, of the origins of comics and comics, it was first chain store in operation. It's like all the other comics book stores took our lead across the whole country, opening yeah. well, up how many next to you, colleges. Did you have Every together? single yeah. one were following our lead. Um, Pardon? I said, how many stores did you have all together? Because I know you opened the first one in Berkeley, and then you... That was August yeah. of 72. And then we were inspired off of, some degree off of, um, what had happened at the El Cortez. The, this explosion that was just jammed full of people by Saturday and Sunday. It kept getting bigger and stuff like this. Because these friends kept, they kept calling their friends up north. This whole L.A. crowd was coming down. And they definitely were making it because there was all these back east dealers with all this brand new stuff they hadn't seen at earlier San Diego cons or L.A. shows from back east. You know, people that were working Thursdays and Fridays. I mean, they make their money. Yeah. They're, they're Saturday, you know. And, but their friends were saying, hey, there's like all this cool stuff. I mean, I bought from uh, John. Bruce Hamilton had gotten in on this deal where, where he bought all um, these uh, um, Donald Duck one sheets, movie one sheets. He bought them. He, he only went to 1939 for like 10 bucks a movie poster, a cartoon poster. Yeah, yeah. Well, from the guy that had them and stuff like that, I bought from 1939 to, or 1940 probably, till 1953 when the last Donald, for like five bucks each. I don't know, like, you know, does, I mean, quite all, every Donald cartoon poster ever made. I mean, I was being offered like that Marvel Mania artwork was starting to 
come out and stuff like that. You know, the, the centerfold out of Steranko's Shield Number Three, the Hound of the Baskerville story. Guy was trying to get fifty dollars for it. So I like, was toying between buying that or buying all these Donald Luck one sheets. I mean, there was just all kinds of stuff there. And then when people realized it was even more money, then there was all these other people coming down from L.A. with just even more stuff. It was a crazy madhouse. But we got inspired. We opened up this store. When we first opened up, the Berkeley police thought we were a drug smuggling operation. They tapped our phones. Um, we could hear these clicks going on. And this went on for a few months. And... I finally said to John, you know, I think our phone's being tapped and stuff like that. I started describing this major drug deal going down off of University Avenue in between Spangler's Fish Grotto and Brennan's uh, big watering hole for the college student, a thousand car parking lot yeah. under the there. And, and I, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I, uh, I mean, it was, that's for another later date. I mean, the Berkeley police lieutenant came up. We laughed about it 10 years later. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I could go off on all those details. I mean, it was 60, 70 Berkeley cops mm -hmm. were on overtime for the whole weekend. They were, yeah, I mean, like nothing happened. I mean, Well, anyway, how long did that store last, Bob? Did it, uh, well, Comics and Comics yeah. as a firm lasted for 30, over 30 years. Okay. I sold out in 1975. I I went back to school for a year or so, okay. but I was still dealing comics in the Byron's Guide, and I um, went solo in November 76. I opened up my a store in the Haight-Ashbury. It's 100 okay. bucks a month. I'd been selling comics at the Alameda Flea Market that summer, and then it rained, so I had to get a location. I, I mean, it's like I uh, talked these people in. It was 100 bucks a month for this storefront, and half a Hey, Ashbury was like boarded up. The other half was all, like all these bars with junkies in them. It was really down in its lowest level. I'm part of a, of, a, of a crowd of people that came back and brought back the hate to gentrify it on some levels to make it. Anyways, I um, talked them into, um, well, says, you know what? Rent me this spot. You got like six storefronts empty here. Just rent me this one here. I got, took the scuzziest one, cleaned it out, and... Um, I mean, they were empty. It wasn't like there was stuff in there and stuff like that. I said, well, I'll have you the first, the rent within a week. This hundred bucks. And I opened up stuff. I put 20, 30 boxes of comics on the floor, literally a card table with a cigar box and stuff okay. like that. Yeah. And yeah. I had the rent that day. I took $124 oh, wow. in that day. And uh, paid them their rent, took $24 home to the wife, go to the grocery store. Yeah. Things are cool. <laughs> And the next day, started taking more money, and then I started, you know, going to print mint, started going, you know, again and, and, and rip off press for Freak Brothers, print mint for Zaps and other things. Last Gasp had opened up by this point. They were, and they'd been publishing a, a bunch of stuff and, you know, buying stuff from Gary Arlington and then just reconnecting with, you know, getting old comics in. And I started concentrating on the old comics. My ex-partners were concentrating on new stuff. Okay. They never understood, but later on we were fighting on for 14 years on that street. Um, when they moved up the street in May of 77, they moved up the street, and um, I called up the old landlord. I moved right into our, our old spot, my old spot too. It's like, yeah, you know, yeah. they, that, that morning they took the You're last box out. You're about the place over in Berkeley, right? Yeah, right. yeah. That, that, yeah. When that morning they took their last boxes out. That afternoon I was moving my first boxes <laughs> in. For the longest time there were casual buyers and stuff like collectors they thought i was the old comics the comics comics old comics annex yeah, yeah. and and um and they had comics and comics painted in the front in red and all i did was just paint over and c-o-m-i-x i just painted that over and said comics up there and then a friend of mine painted in best of two worlds had a pogo with a lantern off a book walt okay. kelly book cover which was my first initial but again i'm getting ahead of myself here we put in by that was like November when this thing where the Berkeley police were thinking we were a smuggling operation. We figured, no, we got to reach out into the campus. Um, now that we're there, now we got to reach out into the campus. By this time, Don Alt, who runs this, um, I mean, Un University of Florida has major comics holdings now. I hooked him up with Saul Davidson. They bought out a lot of his stuff. He's the first guy that did a... PhD in comics back in 58, but right. he also owns the list for all these comic scholars. That's the comic scholars list on the internet. Yeah. I mean, he owns this. Yeah, but I'm, I'm originally then he was an English professor on at UC Berkeley before he went to Vanderbilt and then on to Florida, which he's like the head of the English department there now or re 
Anyways, back then he did a semester long Karl Marx course that I tried getting into just to audit as a non student, but could never get in. I would didn't know to, enough to ask Don. He would like, Don. He just would have just put me into the thing. So you know, with, with, with a little you know sitting on the floor or some or whatever. But uh, we figured out in December. We started getting involved with putting a, co a Comic Con on the UC Berkeley campus in the AC ASUC building. And between there and April, I mean, the energy started building for the Bay Area. But we were coming off the energy of this first El Corte. I don't, yeah. can it begin to describe the energy that exploded in that first El Cortez show based off of not just the factors of me and Bud on the, on the comic, but just. All these people coming together. Maybe it was just the good weather just yeah. made everybody happier that summer or whatever the reason was. Um, well, and even after you opened the stores, you were still going out to cons, San Diego con and other cons. Up and down, when we opened up the stores, yeah. still going back to the Suling con in New York. Yeah. Okay. Um, still made it to Dallas and stuff like that. In 73, Houston and Dallas were in a big argument. Maybe, maybe, they had agreed that earlier on that there'd be a round robin of Houston and a Dallas and a Oklahoma City, then back to Houston. But Dallas, you know, it was supposed to be Houston's turn. Anyways, in 73, yeah, Dallas and Houston had a show back to back. Okay. Um, and they, um, I mean, it was like one weekend after the other. I mean, Dallas people got mad. They put a show right after the Houston one. Or it might have been the other way around where Dallas made the announcement, then Houston went the weekend before. Yeah. But what that did is it brought in a lot of, again, two shows in Texas brought in a lot of dealers from around the country into that area, neck of the woods. The Houston one that we, it was June of 73, um, which is a couple months after we, we did that big show on Berkeley, we ended up, Robert Grace Smith was political cartoonist of the San Francisco Chronicle Examiner. He got us in on the front page of the pink section for the Sunday thing the week before okay. with a four-page write-up about what's going to be going on there. And so, I mean, thousands of people showed up to this thing. I mean, Bud and I, we, we, God, we worked so hard. I mean, John, I mean, all of us, there were seven of us, seven of us in that crew. I mean, we worked our asses off on that thing, like really bad. But out of that, we had, out of that, we got out this pedigree collection of Tom Riley, what I call the Tom Riley books. Other people want to call them the San Francisco collection, 4,000. Pure Mint comics that had been sitting untouched in somebody's house where the, the, these parents were buying for their son who'd gone off into the Navy in December 1941. The parents were in Piedmont. They bought one of every comic book ever made up through the mid to late summer of 1945. Just okay. one of everything. And when we got most of that, like seven-ninths of it, and out of that, sales and stuff like this, because with three different batches of, um, what do you want to call it, relatives, um, this is where we got the money. In May of 73, we were opening up our second store. A couple months later, we were up at Sacramento, San Jose store. And then a month after that, we opened up a Sacramento store just near the Capitol, stuff mm -hmm. like this, becoming this chain store operation. And then we're like buying houses, we're buying cars and you know stuff like this. And out of that, I broke the $2,000 barrier selling the most valuable comic book in the world to a hunt oil company attorney named Burl Rowe. And... That got eight PUPI wire service coverage all over the country, and then this, this is when comics and comics just started taking off. Okay. Um, out of that, we got three more Detective Twenty Sevens that month. From we sold this one, and they, they, um, Bruce Hamilton, Theo Holstein, and Mitch Mady were had gotten sold an action one. Bruce Hamilton sold an action one to Theo, who sold it to Mitch Mady, where the action one broke the eighteen hundred dollar barrier. And I sold the Wiz one out of the Tom Riley collection of Burl Road to for two thousand dollars, but the newspapers weren't interested. They said, "Oh no, no, you got to go over two thousand dollars." So, when Burl absorbed the Wiz one, a week later he's ready to absorb the Detective Twenty Seven. He offers me two thousand for that one out of this Riley collection, and I go, "No, no, you got to sell it to me, and I got to have a cancel check for more than two thousand, so we can get the newspaper coverage." You know, so we, which he readily agreed to do, and. I'm firmly convinced that that, that that Detective 27 is the same one in the Heritage auction that sold earlier that last year for over a million dollars. Yeah. I'm sure it's the Tom Riley. It looks the same to me. Same thing. People go, how do you know? I go, well, I don't know. How do people know their kids that grow up over the years? It's like, you don't understand. Yeah. I had all these books, but the history books are wrong. Again, yeah. left out of, um, it doesn't describe it properly in the Dark Horse book between the panels. Um, 
called San Francisco. They also got on the road about this Houston accident wrong. But the Gerber book, Ernie Gerber, Photo Journal Guide, he goes in a pretty good depth on the Edgar Church collection, but he got he has it all wrong on what describing the Tom Riley collection, the Cosmic Airplane collection, a couple little like paragraph or two. The only thing he got right was the name of Tom Riley. Um, the size of the collection, uh, the scope of it is like this guy, Mitch Mady, not Mitch Mady, uh, uh, Mike Maniak, he's described in that Dark Horse book, but he only saw the first third of it. So therefore, ergo, yes, he only saw 1,500 books. Well, there was two more thirds that only Comics and Comics got had control over. And then the second, the third third comes in right before the Comic-Con, San Diego Comic-Con that was held at the airport. We bring all that down. One guy bought most of it, Rick Durrell. Um, and that provides the money. He was a major collector. He worked for Standard Oil, stuff like this, vice president, stuff like that. Major, major, high-grade collector. He bought most of that and stuff like that. There never was any list up, made up of any of it. It sold too fast. Yeah. And I'm selling it over a guide. And we'd use that money to open up these other two stores that we had a chunk of change off of Rick. Um, and he took out a bank loan, I think, to buy it. It was thousands of dollars. And, uh, I mean, we paid good money for it. We paid 60% of yeah. guide. I mean, it was pretty fair prices we were paying. Not knowing yeah. as it progressed just how crazy people were going to get, and we could get a yeah. little bit over guide, maybe 20% over guide. But then, you know, as the years progressed, um, and we get into, in, in, into the mid-70s, and I'm still going to San Diego Comic-Con, I... Yeah, that's one of the things I wanted to ask you about. Yeah, I, I mean, you started going from the I meant beginning. to. I meant to get to that earlier, but building yeah, you up started into the going, like, from the very beginning, and you went every year. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how it grew and changed over the years, uh, the, the San Diego Con itself. Well, my understanding is, like, the, the people that owning the El Cortez Hotel, Comic-Con was growing, so they actually, it was like, you know, impacting the hotel itself so they built a tin building across the street or metal building across the street from the back end where the swimming pool was and that's where the dealer's room was and and so but then it kept growing and growing in about 1980 or so it it had to move over to the civic center and stuff like that and it kept growing from there and it's just um, um as the years progressed and i'm like just just acquiring more and more comics and stuff like that. And Tom French, who was actually, I mean, I, first book he ever bought, I still remember, was a brownies, a brown cover with a with a, a dog being washed by these little brownies and stuff like this. Um, 1949, he was looking mm -hmm. at it. He's describing this funeral he just come from. He's really depressed and sad. I had this as a kid. And it was a mint copy, too, I mean, or near me. It was, we didn't, it was actually the grading definitions were like, it was either it was nice or it wasn't yeah. to a lot of people. But I had three bucks on it. I make it at two bucks and stuff like that. He bought that thing. We had a good chat. He, then he goes out in the room. He's in there for a couple hours. Oh, I got to better get back to Virginia. And then, uh, you know, I mean, anyways. But then a few years later, he's running the dealer's room and stuff like this. But as I'm growing up in the Bay Area and I'm accumulating more and more books and I open up that second store on my own, then it's like kept getting the publicity, going on TV. Um, I'm the first guy that, ever advertise a comic book store on TV, like ever. And Marvel Comics was helping pay for it. Um, we we're going to make up our own live action thing. I was just a, yeah. One of my employees dressed up as Spider-Man and swinging on a rope going into my Haight-Ashbury store. And Carol Cayley's got wind of that. And, oh, no, 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 no. They made up a Spider-Man spot, animated spot and a Transformers spot for me and stuff like that. And they were paying a, a chunk of it. I mean, it's like... Um, but as the Comic Con kept growing, that was feeding into more and more conventions opening up uh, up and down the whole West Coast. I mean, a Portland one would open up, a Seattle one was opening up. They were trying them out in, in Fresno and Sacramento and L.A. That club that was every month would, would kept growing and stuff like that. And but the Comic Con, as it grew into a life of its own, where guys like Shell Dorf. You know, well, Mike and Richard Alf. I mean, they they fell away from it and stuff like that. It was becoming too much too much work. But the people that yeah. then started making a nobody's making a living out of it. Yeah. But as the people that started making a living out of it, they uh, yeah. I mean, it, it kind of pushed Shell out of it. Yeah. You know, which 
I mean, there's many reasons for pro and con and stuff like that, and at the times and stuff like that. You know, part of what Shell was mentality of, of it was, you know, kind of justified, but not really, you know. But he got voted out by this board of directors that kept growing and stuff like this. And, um, I mean, I, I mean, I've got fond memories of each year going there as the thing grew. It started not becoming fun when it moved from the Civic Center over to that convention center in the early 90s and stuff like that. But 1985, I think, is when Alan Moore showed up. Okay. Watchmen and his Swamp Thing. I think it might have been before Watchmen had come out. But I remember that I'm at my tables and stuff like this. It might have been 87. I don't remember the exact year, but it's like this, this long-haired guy with British accent. He's looking through my back issues of Mort Weisinger, Jimmy Olsen's, and Lois Lane's. And I just get into this incredible conversation with this about the bottle city of Candor and the Superman yeah. Emergency Squad, and Superman Red and Superman Blue, and, and, and all this other stuff. And we're, but uh, especially all the minutia about the Bottle City of Candor. And we're just going back and forth and back and forth. And this crowd starts gathering. And I don't know who it is and stuff like this. And there's, all of a sudden there's like 40, 50 people, and it's like crowded around, and people on the peripherals are trying to listen to us. Yeah. Cycle babbled. We, we're going back and forth on a and fast this is banner. this out on the exhibit floor. And, this out and, on the yeah. dealer's room and stuff like this. And, and, uh, and he's building up a stack, and I go, I'm pointing out where the Bottle City Candor is like first showing up. You need this one then, and all this other stuff. I mean, I'm pointing out to him things that he needed if this is what he yeah. – was, was, was liking and stuff like this. This is what I was doing for people. Is I actually read all these comics. Yeah. So, so I've never stopped being a fan. Yeah. I mean, I stopped reading new comics in 94 when um, Heroes World was bought by Marvel Comics. And that to me, that's the end of the direct sales market because it all collapses. And um, Capital City, John Davis and Milton Greep you know, were fighting over with Steve Jeppe over the kibbles and bits left over of DC on down of who's going to be exclusive with this distributor, that distributor. But the stupidest thing Marvel ever did, I think, for growing the business in this thing, because at that point it became a circular firing squad getting ever smaller since then, for the most part. There's been blips and, you know, some books when the movie, this or that movie would come out, but by and large, um, when, when those idiots at Marvel that owned it then tried to make Heroes World the exclusive Marvel distributor, not understanding that, you know, you have to buy everything. You know, mm -hmm. these small stores, you, know, you, you can't have this one thing, that hurdle to reach here, then the hurdle to reach over there. And it, what it did is it put out all the other distributors out of business. But when Alan Moore was there and stuff, I don't yeah. didn't know it was Alan Moore. I'm just psycho-babbling with this guy. We are talking Bottle City of Candor and all this stuff going on in Brainiac and things like this and this big crowd and I'm yelling at people, get your damn elbows out of my books because they'll have their elbows in the books. I mean, they're like really crunching in because they're really mm -hmm. trying to lean into here. We're talking 40, 50 people, you know, when he's standing there, I'm standing here. That's quite a crowd. Might have been more people yeah. than that because there's people like 10 feet away trying to hear this. And I'm trying to figure out how can there all be these people wanting to listen to the Bottle City of Candor and being yeah. shrunk down in the Superman Emergency Squad and all this other stuff going on and Streaky the Cat and Super Horse and Crypto the Dog I mean, Adventure 210 and as this guy here from Britain, I'm like, what's going on here? I finally asked him, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> and he says, well, I said, well, I'm a little hesitant to say because we've been having a really good conversation. You know, and he finally says he's Alan Moore, and I'm, you know, I mean, yeah. that didn't phase me. You know, like all these other people are, you because know, I, because yeah. I'm, I'm really actually walking down there and I'm hitting people's elbows. I'm getting really <laughs> pissed. They're damaging my books. Yeah, ten feet down here, they're trying to listen and stuff like that. So I'm just walking back and forth, and he and I were just, you know, having this conversation. The only time I ever got the fanboy in me got taken away from me. I mean, you know, it was um, shoot. I'm walking back from the, that tin room up at the the dealer's room by, at El Cortez. I'm walking back a stack of books I don't want to trade off or sell. Back to my hotel room. I'm going to stick them there, go up the elevator, stick them there. I won't be tempted to move those suckers at all. And there's this old guy shuffling along. He's got a stack of comic books, too, and we started talking. And it's like, I'm, hi, I'm Bob. I'm, I'm Frank. I mean, blah, blah, blah. And we're talking. And he's talking all this 1920s and 30s comics and stuff like that. And I'm getting quite an education in this from this guy. And we get to the elevator, and we've been talking for quite some time again. And, it's like, and, and he didn't 
he was yeah. blown away. I'm like, I'm, I knew about the Gumps. I knew about Crazy Cat. I knew yeah. about these earlier strips from when he was a kid because I'd met up with Ernie McGee, the earliest comic collector in the world, who gave me Yellow Kid comic strips one, two, and four. Back in 1971, there were his triplicates. That Yellow Kid book that came out in 1995 was Ernie's collection, went to Jack Herbert, then on to Black, Bill Blackbeard, and that was become the Kitchen Sink book. But way back when, I mean, I took a train. He was in Upper Gloucester, New Jersey. But anyways, I'm walking back to the elevator. I get sidetracked. I'm, telling, I'm sorry, because all these memories. Um, and... I'm talking to him and stuff like that. And after about 20 minutes of standing in front of the elevator, I go, well, I'm, I'm Robert Beerbaum. And he goes, well, I'm Frank Capra. <laughs> and I'm going, you, you can hear my chin <laughs> womp on the floor. And I go, fuck, I've been talking to Frank Capra for like half an hour and didn't know it. And he goes, yeah, again, like Alan Moore said, which is what jogged me to go back to Frank Capra. He says, yeah, I never tell people who I am because this is, is exactly what happens. You know, because I started gushing about you know, Mr. Smith goes to Washington and some of these other, it's a wonderful life. Like all these movies with Jimmy Stewart and stuff like that. And on and on how much I loved his work and all this other stuff. And yeah, but then, you know, but we didn't get, we stopped talking about what he was down there for yeah. was collecting old comics. Yeah. You know, That's so. That's pretty cool. Anyways, I mean, yeah, he's the only one I can remember. I mean, I remember when we first opened up Comics and Comics, like, you know, Francis Ford Coppola was one of our early you know, just had done like first or second Godfather. It was no big deal. I mean, Bruce Lee used to shop in the store before he got the kill, but it was before I entered the Dragon. Um, so he yeah. was just he'd bring Brandon in as a kid, yeah. you know. But he's just you know Cato out of Green Hornets for you know, up until yeah. June of '73. But by that point, he was already dead. But Francis Ford Coppola was coming in as a as a customer, you know, buying old comics. I mean, where do you guys think these guys get their inspiration? Frank Capra said he got a lot of inspiration from reading a lot of the comic strips that were current when he was a kid, and you know, twenties and thirties when these continuity strips started going up. And Gasoline Alleys is showing slice of life, and The Gumps is showing slice of life that people don't understand the transformation that started happening in the comics in the twenties. But I was learning all this stuff from the these older guys and yeah. stuff like I mean I was like fascinated with the whole history early on yeah. I told you Fanzation 5 I'm here I'm running articles about the origin of Alter Ego the yeah. origin of EC fandom from Ted White and Jack Promo from these guys from were around from the 50s that I encountered and stuff like that so I've always had a fascination with the archaeology aspect of mm -hmm. all this stuff archaeology worldwide as far as that goes but um, where was I at? Uh, what do you want me you to were ask? talking about Frank Capra, you know. But well, before you know, before we finish up today, I want to make sure. sure we get to something. I wanted to ask you about your impressions of Comic Con now, as it exists now. Well, the studios have I mean, come we in talked and taken about over. How the studios really, have yeah. simply come in and taken note over. In some respects, it's just an evolutionary trip. Um, if it was ever moved to like Las Vegas, to the bigger venue or whatever and stuff like that, it would die. It would die in a heartbeat because it's too damn hot in Las Vegas in the summertime, for yeah. starters. Um, and then a town like that. But see, San Diego Comic San Diego itself has pretty much taken over the show where, you know, all the hotels. I mean, Motel 6, excuse me, almost like deleted expletive. Motel <laughs> 6 goes up to $350 that weekend. You know, that, that's insane. I mean, $10 parking places are $30 just that week. You know, yeah. on Monday, the Marriott Hotel, which is four hundred and seventy-five dollars, which I stayed there one year when my that this year I had this problem that I need to work out with Comic Con and stuff like that. I but I was at the Marriott it was four hundred and seventy-five dollars a night. Yeah. Monday night was a hundred and forty dollars back down to normal. Embassy Suites jacks it up, comes down. I mean, they can do this, but I think at some point here, you know, I don't know. For me, the fun, the thrill is gone. It's a B.B. King song. B.B. King song. B.B. Yeah. King? Yeah, B.B. Yeah. King song. Excuse me. Um, and the thrill is definitely gone. It hasn't been fun for over 10 years. But it, up, up until the point where I, I'd stopped. You know, there was this thing going on and stuff like that. that yeah. You know, lawyers were saying, I, I can't talk to Comic-Con people. They can't talk to me while this thing was going on and stuff like that. And I just, like... You know, stop going. I didn't even go this year. It's like, it's and like, this was the first year you hadn't gone since the very first one. Yeah, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. There was a there's a small club of us, fifty sixty left, I estimate, and there was four of us left. This Tony Riola, I'm an Italian fellow, I introduced you. He should technically be the fifth guy that sold there every year since the first one, and uh, we did it for the fun of it, for the heart of it. Making money was just part of it. 
um, really was and stuff like that. People have their perceptions when you get to be a big dealer, you're just uh, you know in it for the money. Yeah. No, no, I've, I've always been in it for the the research of like how this all interconnects, how these these creators were creating this stuff, how these publishers were able to rip them all off for the most part. This fight for creators' rights is what drove me. Royalty paying creator owned comics is ultimately Will Eisner was saying one thing and he was talking about creators' rights back in in 72 about this young kid Robert Crumb doing his thing about wow this underground trip happened out of that's why Eisner ends up with connecting with Dennis Kitchen and they're doing this Will Eisner quarterly and all this you know mm -hmm. stuff like this and he's interconnecting Ditko's trying to interconnect with the underground back in the early days with Mr. A you know Whitsand but Wally Wood getting off the ground and stuff these were creator owned things being trying to be self published but there was no infrastructure there yet this is what Eisner and I talked about which I, I in turn it was imparting to Bud and John about putting that store up when we, that store opened up on Telegraph Avenue where you got to go to where the cu your customers are growing up into where they're at and then we're gonna go in and subvert UC Berkeley the best and the brightest according to this mm -hmm. book that was written right which I read about the Vietnam War or you know CIA and whatever growing up there and stuff like this free speech movements free expression movements I mean uh, um, and as Comic Con was growing up, the underground people were coming down to the show because we were up there and up there saying to all these underground guys that were moving in because of Robert Crumb up in the Bay Area. Comic Con's the thing you got to come down to. I mean, I talked Gilbert Shelton into coming down to the first show for the first time. He used to get stoned with him, play ping pong at 17th of Missouri <laughs> up on the second floor. You come in for your weekly. We were selling, selling a thousand Freak Brothers a week. I mean, it was yeah. like it was. We were running out. I mean, the, the undergrounds were selling way good. I mean, we had to make those early days. We had to make an adult sections that was roped off. Kids couldn't oh, go right, in. Right. You know, all that kind of stuff. It wasn't about trying to. I mean, we look like you're under 18. I mean, we didn't get want to get busted. Yeah. But again, we want to also make adult comics that could have whatever is going to be happening in there. The, that freedom. You know, I remember when uh, Harvey Picard is coming out with this his bio comics of American Splendor mm -hmm. and stuff like this, to the point where. You know, in 1990, 1990, 91, Terry Zweigoff, um, Crumb, Robert, and Eileen Kaminsky are to move over to France. And Terry Zweigoff starts documenting him in the Bay Area because, like, Terry comes into my shop. He was collecting old Barks comics from yeah. me and stuff like this. And he's going, God, what if the airplane crashes? And, you know, cr you know all this stuff that could be asked of Crumb will just be lost. You know, and so... But my last Haight Ashbury store, my last store, is immortalized in the Crumb movie in 1995. That's my store. Right. Nobody can take that away from me. You know, it's like all these other things that was like, I mean, I put up the first billboard advertising. I mean, giant billboard. DC Comics paid me paid half of this thing for the Batman movie in 1989. It ended up every TV show, every TV station in in the whole Bay Area came to my store to film me twice. And then Channel 2 came back and did a 20-minute segment on business on how to grow this comic book trip. Put this big, giant Batman, your one-stop Batman shop with this 35-foot head of the Joker that was patterned up originally after the Brian Boland out of the killing joke that Alan Moore and mm -hmm. Brian Boland had drawn, this big, giant you know, Joker landed in the asylum. I mean, it's a famous bottom-page panel. When did you see it, you go, oh, yeah, that's the one. Originally, they put that up, but the DC Warner uh, lawyers... Um, said it was too intense but it was at the corner of felon de visadero before the um you know this went up oh. in in may i started working on it in february of 89 in may of 89 it went up for two months it was this billboard is so intense you can only rent it for two months and there's a waiting list for like three or four years to get that billboard you come off the fellow lagoon exit on your way to golden gate oh, park i know, it. I know it's that. like it's the only billboard all the way to Golden Gate Park. And then you, and you hit the panhandle. There's a, a, a BP station right there at the bottom and stuff like this. And this billboard, it just captured the imagination. It's like I made a bat cave in there. Uh, I had 387 different Batman products. I mean, dozens of different T-shirts. I mean, they were double parked yeah. and that billboard went up. And when they were double parked and then a San Francisco hook and ladder truck pulled up and triple parked, <laughs> blocking the other oncoming other oncoming uh, traffic and like nine guy firemen get off of that thing and they come in we got to get out of here fast so it's like they're buying bat just yeah. grabbing a bat each everybody's putting on batman t-shirts so you, you get caught up in all this promotional stuff of expanding the consciousness of read more comics and stuff like that when marvel 
was going to make Heroes World the distributor in 94, exclusive from, from Marvel, and, and then Capital City went under and stuff like that. The concept for the longest time of expanding this direct sales market went away because when it was all said and done, Heroes World couldn't handle it. Most of the stores couldn't meet those minimums. Um, and Jeppy ends up getting Marvel also. So we end up back with this monopoly that was there. Back when Suling first started bringing in, in 73, it was pretty much a monopoly on comics being distributed yeah. in the country. So that came full circle. So the, the direct sales market went away and stuff like that. Uh, the, they, used, they stopped having the cocktail parties with get, bringing all the guests. Yeah. They started having too many guests. My understanding with 150,000 people, there's 6,000 guests at, oh, yeah. at Comic-Con now. So to me, the evolutionary process, looking at how comics were super popular back in the 20s and 30s, as radio came in, as movies came in, as TVs came, came, came in, comic strip artists in the newspapers were superstars, millionaires making the big, well, some of them were making big bucks uh, George McManus on Bringing Up Father, but, uh, Bud Fisher on Mutt and Jeff. They're paying, be, being paid seven figures back then. And 95% of the American population was reading comics, adults and kids. When this comic book phenomenon, when they finally got the distribution down, it's always been about distribution. It's never been about so much the printing process. If they've been down. It's being able to get them out of a printing plant and coordinate. Uh, I don't want to. I almost started bringing up, you know, like running the trains over in Nazi mm. Germany to certain camps, of getting that efficiency down that like eight of, but getting the the um, comics coming where they got centralized Marvel and DC being printed at World Color Press, and then coordinating the shipping, of the timing of this stuff coming across country where they're all coming out on sale at the same time, but then after the Batman TV show glut. I mean, I mean, there's been several gluts. There's this big three billion issue glut back in '52, that was a backlash of the Catholic Church coming down on all these Jewish-owned businesses because the kids are all mesmerized. But the evolutionary process, where I'm coming to a point, might not sound like it, of when the comics started moving out of being on the printed page, and then I remember when the Dungeons and Dragons phenomena, all these fantasy role board games were coming out and stuff like that. You can, people can start making their own fantasies rather than reading somebody else's. But then you take the energy off of these D&D type games, these fantasy role playing games. I mean, Chaosium was in Berkeley and stuff like that. The guys writing that, those games at Chaosium, they were customers of mine. They were buying comic books, yeah. getting ideas to put in these fantasy role-playing games. TSR, that started exploding. They started holding their own shows and stuff like that. With the technology now of computers, it's all moving. I mean, the, the generation that, it's like my kids. Their kids are going to grow up, and they're not going to be reading paper. They're just not. I mean, it's going to be Star Trek tricorders. Yeah. I mean, all the world's knowledge is going into the cloud, yeah. as we might say. I'm getting harassed now. Yeah. I mean, I've got backup with, with, with a, a you know external hard drive, but I'm I'm being harassed by this little box that keeps showing up on my computer to back up my files up in the cloud. Well, where's that coming from? I mean, somebody out there that owns everything wants all the world's knowledge into one spot, where we'll all be able to regurgitate what they'll allow us to. But this is where the comics market's going to. Yeah. It is. We're going to be reading all this stuff, but computer games are all about making your own comic book, basically, now. You can make your own comic book. It's like the design studios that are out there now of... Neil Adams, his design studios collapsed. Everybody's got Photoshop. You don't need somebody to design your ad. You just plug it in. You, so he's back in the comic book world hitting all these shows now, selling artwork and stuff like that because so it's all an evolutionary process. I've got no problem with it. Well, Bob, we're just about out of time. I'm just going to ask you if you have any closing statement you'd like to make. And we thank you very much today. This was... Yeah, we should do this again down the road after you've like re, you know gone through what uh -huh. I've done. I've got thousands more of these stories. You have we've just scratched the surface. I'm not trying to boast or nothing yeah. like this. This is what I get told. I've been told for quite a few years. All this stuff you'd be talking about. This is all a you know a sum total. It's like Fahrenheit 451. It's just, you know it's like I've been taught all this stuff from the thousands of people I met out there. So 
I'm the sum total of their existence in comics now. I need to get this stuff out, if it means anything, for future generations and historians. At 61, this is where my brain's at. Now that I recover from these hip joints, I can think again. You know, I think that, you know, Comic-Con itself, you know, they owe me an apology from what happened in 2010 off of something that somebody was claiming that it fell apart. Their whole case, there was a bunch of lies back in February. They owe me an apology. Um, and I'm not going to come to them to demand this or whatever. It's like, I didn't do anything then. And I hope they watch this. I really do. Because there was a whole bunch of people came together for that Comic Con. It wasn't just their little crowd of people that put on a show that if they build it, I mean, like I said, if a forest, a tree falls in the forest and, it, and, it, and nobody heard it, did it, did it make a sound? You know, it's like, some of us were bringing those dealers in. Some of us, the underground guys, me, me and Bud and whoever were coming down to this Comic-Con, there was no connection there. I mean, Art Spiegelman coming over from the Bay Area, they were all drawn to Crumb. Mm -hmm. The whole energy was, was a whole different thing that they didn't know how to connect to the Comic-Con down here because it was all code comics. It was all, right. for the most part, and stuff like yeah. that. That whole concept of creator-owned royalty-paying comics had to be developed. It was all a synergy of... Hundreds and hundreds of people coming together. And I would like to think I had a tiny little piece, okay? Because even though I've been psychobabbling a lot about all this stuff, it's like I'm not claiming credit for, like, doing anything other than inter interfacing with a bunch of people and a whole bunch of other people interfacing with each other. And something came together that was really neat. Yeah. And that first El Cortez show, I was just blown away by the energy because I'd already been doing Comic Con since '67, but that '72 first El Cortez show, and with all those books, all these dealers from back east that mean butted. Well, where can we go to make money? Because we were doing this. They all knew we were doing this circuit. Which one should we go to? And we'll, we'll say, well, San Diego Comic Con, and like you know, and they were sold out. I get there and I can't get my, my booth. You know, yeah. they didn't have a record of it. But I luckily had that, you know, it all comes together on some levels.